agencies as well. Uh, this is our first hearing on the President's fiscal year 2021 budget request. Um, however, I want to start with a matter of urgency. Uh, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, cases are growing, as is alarm. Uh, this is both domestically and internationally. Uh, the U.S. government has responded to the COVID-19 outbreak with aggressive measures. Significant travel restrictions, a mandatory 14-day quarantine for individuals returning to the U.S. from Hubei province. Mr. Secretary, I support your declaration of a public health emergency. We are dealing with the likelihood of a global pandemic. It was interesting to note yesterday from the CDC that commented that with regard to the United States, it's not a question of if, but a question of when uh, we will face this issue seriously uh, here. That said, I have serious concerns about the administration's responsiveness with respect to funding. I understand senators of both parties expressed a similar concern to you at their hearing yesterday. I have repeatedly asked for information about expenditures thus far and about the balances remaining in the Infectious Disease Rapid Response Reserve Fund. And yet, we have not received an adequate answer. In addition, you submitted a letter late Monday night notifying the committee that you would begin transferring up to $136 million from other HHS programs, including NIH and the Low Income Energy Assistance Program. And on Monday, the administration finally submitted a request for an emergency supplemental funding, uh, but there is no supporting documentation. You must share that information immediately. In that request, the administration all also asked permission to shift more than $500 million from Ebola preparedness. That is a mistake, and we are not robbing funding for other emergency activities to pay for this emergency. There was another $536 million, $550 million of reprioritized uh, funding uh, uh, and funding that was provided for uh, fiscal year 2020. Uh, and it's, that funding is coming from other uh, HHS programs. We know of the, the uh, uh, and we need to know uh, specifically where that money is being uh, uh, cut from. What the American people need is an emergency supplemental bill that answers these questions, supports development of therapies and a vaccine, funds state and local agencies and health care providers, and strengthens our public health infrastructure. And the American people, Mr. Secretary, need to know that now. There is, as you know, there is great alarm and consternation in the country about this. Another important issue, an issue that I, like many Americans, find deeply disturbing, is the administration's ongoing and cruel treatment of asylum seekers and children entering the United States. In recent weeks, we learned that agents with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, are showing up at HHS-funded shelters to fingerprint 14-year-olds in the Unaccompanied Children Program. That is outrageous. They are allowing ICE agents to intimidate kids. I recognize that there is a statute, but it remains the responsibility of HHS to ensure the safest environment for the children. So I want HHS to make clear to its grantees that children are to have a representative present to allay their fears and ensure their understanding of the process. And I would, and I expect my colleagues on the subcommittee, would want to see a copy of that guidance. We also learned that ORR took confidential notes from children's therapy sessions and shared them with ICE for multiple years. I appreciate your comments on stopping this. It should not have happened. You and I know this, that it cannot happen again. There needs to be a firewall 
with DHS. ORR is not an immigration enforcement agency. Its mission is to provide for the care and the welfare of children. Turning to your budget, Mr. Secretary, despite what you may try to say, this document would hurt millions of Americans, and you have to ask who is paying the price. It is not the wealthy or well-off. No, it is the vulnerable who are the victims. It is the working people, middle-class families of this country, who would be forced to do less with less. This is a time they need more help, but you are proposing to cut $10 billion from the Department of Health and Human Services, an 11 percent cut. You are leaving people at risk of a potential pandemic by cutting $700 million from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and especially the Infectious Diseases Rapid Response Reserve Fund. You are telling suffering families that we will not do all we can to help their ill loved ones by cutting $3 billion from the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's leading biomedical research institution, and you would want to hit the brakes on that research. It is unacceptable. You would leave people without enough trained doctors and nurses by cutting hundreds of millions of dollars for training for health care careers like nursing. The health issues of this nation require a trained health care workforce. You would force 6 million seniors to have to choose between eating, buying prescription drugs, heating or cooling their homes by eliminating LIHEAP, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. And you would reject the bipartisan intention of this Congress to save lives and address the public health crisis by ending the $25 million for gun violence prevention research. 100 Americans are killed every day by guns. 36,000 per year, two-thirds of which are suicides, a particular concern for our veterans. That is not all. On the mandatory side, you would take away health insurance from 20 million Americans by cutting health care by $1 trillion over 10 years and eliminating the Affordable Care Act and its Medicare expansion, Medicaid expansion. And you are still in federal court to repeal the Affordable Care Act, endangering the health coverage for 130 million Americans with pre-existing conditions. To date, you have not come up with a comprehensive plan to help. I could go on, and I am not. But the consequences of your budget would leave us as individuals and as a nation less healthy, less safe, and less able uh, with respect to economic security. And so we will not allow you to go after millions of Americans. Instead, we will continue to invest in health workforce programs, medical research, and the public health, because it is what American people need and what the American people deserve. I appreciate the administration's request for increased funding to reduce maternal mortality, as well as additional funding to address tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease. Although it is one step forward and three steps backwards, as the growth in incidence of Lyme disease is related to climate change, and yet you propose to eliminate the CDC's climate change program. The administration is also requesting increased funding for the second year of an HIV initiative to reduce transmission of HIV by 90 percent over 10 years. We strongly share that ambitious goal. Again, I have to note the contradiction at the heart of this, because the administration is simultaneously proposing to cut NIH's HIV research portfolio, USID's PEPFAR program, eliminate the Affordable Care Act, and eviscerate Medicaid. These are programs essential to combating HIV. In fact, Medicaid is the largest payer for HIV care in the United States. So much to discuss today. We appreciate your being here. And before we turn to you for your testimony, let me turn to our ranking member, uh, Congressman Cole, for remarks that he would like to make. Congressman thank you. Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I've got some prepared remarks that I'm going to uh, read in just a second. But before I do, I want to begin by thanking you. I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, the professionals at the Center for Disease Control and the National Institute of Health, uh, the <laughs> folks that you have supervising our strategic stockpile. Uh, I think uh, you guys have uh, your team uh, and working with other departments. I know you've worked very closely with Homeland Security and Transportation. You've been up here briefing us on a very regular basis. Uh, have done a really remarkable job in responding to something that this committee has been preparing for for years. And this committee ought to be very proud of its work on a bipartisan basis, providing the tools 
uh, for you and your colleagues to respond. And, and through you, I want to thank the President. The President's taken very strong and decisive action here in terms of protecting our borders. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to see this uh, supplemental here. And, uh, you know, I, I suspect we will change it in some ways. My good friend, the Chairman, makes some points that I agree with her on. And I wouldn't be surprised to see you back here. But you're doing the right thing. You've used the resources we've given you. You've come back for a supplemental. I have no doubt you'll come back again if you feel like you, you need them uh, or need additional support. And I have no doubt, frankly, that Congress will be forthcoming. I have to tell you, I've heard a lot of stuff, not on this committee, and certainly isn't, but, but particularly in the other body, that i got to tell you, it's just transparently political claptrap. Uh, and that's what it is. And when I hear people say, well, the president's done, it's too little and too late, I think, where have you been? We've been preparing for this, honestly, before this administration was here. We had five years in a row of substantial NIH funding. I know my, my friend, uh, uh, the chairman, uh, worked with me when I was chairman. I've tried to work with her as her ranking member. We've shared this goal all along the way. We've done the same thing at CDC. We've done the same thing with strategic stockpile. It was this subcommittee that came up with the, infe the Infectious Disease Rapid Response Fund that gave you the initial money to not wait around on Congress or, or political theatrics, but to start responding immediately. And I think you've done that exceptionally well. So when I hear you criticized by people that in many cases didn't vote for the bills, uh, that gave you the tools, uh, then I regard that as political as opposed to substantive. Last point I want to make on this is I really appreciate the briefings that we've gotten. Congress as a whole has gotten. You've been, uh, you know, had your representatives here before this committee. Our chairman uh, did a wonderful job in, in bringing in folks, and we had an honest and open dialogue. So the idea that we haven't been kept well informed or people have not said, look, we're going to do our very best, but this is an unpredictable disease. This could spread at any time. Uh, these are not warnings that I just heard in the last 24 hours. These are things that your, your team has been telling us from the very beginning. Uh, and it suggests to me that uh, the administration has been on top of this. And again, I appreciate the president in that regard from the very beginning. So uh, I know you're, uh, yeah, I was going to open by asking you, how's your last week been? Um, but uh, I, I was afraid I'd get an honest answer. So I, I don't want to begin that way. Uh, but I, I do want to commend you, and I mean that with all sincerity. You're, one, I think, one of the best cabinet officers that the president has, and, and I think you, you and your team serve this country very well. I think this incident is proof of that, uh, not a contradiction to it. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me uh, again wish you good morning. I look forward to hearing uh, the hearing today. Department of Health and Human Services has broad responsibility covering almost every aspect of daily life. In the next year, you're projecting almost a $1.4 trillion uh, in outlay. Uh, you oversee health care for our seniors and Native Americans and ensure both the quality and safety of the nation's food and drug supply. Your agency forms the backbone of the public health infrastructure and is responsible for the development of medical protections against infectious diseases and chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear agents. Discretionary spending provided by this subcommittee amounts, um, you know, accounts for a, only a small fraction of your overall total, really just 8% of your outlays. Um, in just the last two years, I was reflecting about your tenure as secretary, you've responded to unprecedented storms, leaving thousands of limited access to health care in Puerto Rico, a humanitarian crisis at our southern border, an opioid addiction, uh, addiction epidemic, and most recently, the spread of a new infectious disease from China. And I want to commend you and your leadership of this agency. First, I want to address the aggressive budget uh, you put before us. Uh, we know the cuts proposed are deep and, quite frankly, unlikely to be sustained. And I also know who writes the budget. They're called the uh, uh, OMB, the, uh, you know, uh, Office of Management and Budget. And uh, you get to submit things, but you have to come out and defend the decisions that are made there. And I appreciate that. And you work for the president. You have to do that. But I want to stress continued cuts to discretionary spending will not solve the nation's fiscal problems, period. It's not possible to balance our national budget by chipping away at discretionary spending. We must look to broader entitlement reform to achieve the valued goal of a balanced budget. Nearly 90 percent of your agency is entitlement spending on autopilot. The authorizing committees of jurisdiction need to tackle the mounting problem of entitlement spending. I know, Mr. Secretary, you know these figures, but I hope those listening will take heed and recognize the challenges with federal spending are not within the discretionary spending controlled by the Appropriations Committee. 
Second, I want to stress again uh, that while small compared to your total outlays, the discretionary component of your budget uh, that we're going to talk about uh, today plays a critical role for our country. Moreover, several programs we will discuss here today touch the life of every American. I usually start with the National Institute of Health, but today I think it's fitting uh, to highlight how important the Center for Disease Control and Prevention is to protect the health of the American people. In the span of just a few weeks, we've witnessed a massive interagency undertaking to respond to the novel coronavirus from China. Uh, the CDC is built on lessons learned from past outbreaks and was positioned to respond, inform, deploy, and protect. Hundreds of staff were marshaled quickly to work on different elements of the response efforts. While not everything has gone perfectly, the agency has shown the value of preparing for the unexpected and having a transparent, proactive communication strategy. I urge this committee to increase its support for the Infectious Disease Rapid Reserve Fund at the CDC. As I've said uh, here before, the threat of a pandemic is far greater than a terrorist event. Having resources uncommitted and immediately available is vital. I know many are disappointed uh, to once again see proposed reductions for the National Institute of Health. And you and I have had very candid conversations about this. I, too, uh, agree with my chairman here that a reduction there is unwise. However, I do want to point out this budget actually is $12 billion more for the NIH than the level proposed just four years ago. So it's not as if you haven't recognized the value there. And uh, frankly, I think uh, you're going to catch up to us someday and you're going to be with us uh, in uh, continuing this bipartisan effort to increase this spending. Uh, I ardently urge Congress to continue to maintain its commitment to sustained increases for biomedical research. And I'm pleased to see that uh, with each budget, the total request for NIH continues to increase. I hope decades from now, future legislators commend the work of this committee for showing its commitment to biomedical research and maintaining American dominance in basic science. Recent news reports highlighting efforts by the Chinese government to steal intellectual property and use financial incentives to manipulate researchers stresses the importance of our advantage. We should be proud the knowledge gained from hard work of our scientists is the envy of the world. But we must also understand protecting and safeguarding that information is necessary to ensuring the nation's security. I also want to highlight your commitment to emergency preparedness. However, I was disappointed to see the reduction in Project BioShield and the Infectious Disease Rapid Response Reserve Fund and only flat funding uh, of the Strategic National uh, Stockpile and the Biomedical uh, Advanced uh, Research and Development Agency, or BARDA as it's known. And again, I'll, I'll just be candid with you. I, I attribute that to OMB more than I do to people at HHS. Uh, and we can have that discussion later because this whole Congress and administration needs a serious discussion uh, on, um, on spending, but that's been true for a long time and under previous administrations as well. Our country needs to be ready to respond to any event to protect the health of the nation. These programs are the nation's front line of defense against a domestic chemical, biological, or nuclear attack or infectious disease outbreak. We know current funding levels are not enough to have the nation prepared for a large-scale event. Therefore, reductions here, in my view, are misguided. I do want to recognize the $50 million increase for pandemic flu. While the current flu season has been milder than in years past, it still resulted in thousands of hospitalizations and hundreds of deaths, including children. And I'm encouraged by the commitment expressed in your budget to increase vaccination rates and efforts to develop more effective vaccines. We will save lives with those investments. Your budget also proposes to provide an additional $680 million for the Unaccompanied Children Program. This program has been a difficult and unpredictable, has had a difficult and unpredictable history, resulting in a deficiency and highly contentious supplemental appropriation last year. Your agency's efforts to move the program to a more stable position to respond to increases in arrivals at the southern border is long overdue. Building a system that can accommodate unpredictable arrivals at the southern borders is both necessary and responsible management of federal resources. Finally, I, again, I want to personally thank you for your, the efforts that you've undertaken in your agency to protect the life of innocent children and respect a person's right to follow their religious beliefs. I support your efforts to align the Title X Family Planning Program with current law and ensure a separation between family planning services and abortion. I also support your efforts to allow for the free exercise of conscience and health 
insurance coverage and enforce uh, current law provisions which prohibit discrimination based off a decision not to support an abortion. Again, I appreciate the job you've done for the American people. I look forward to your testimony here today. We now yield to the chair of the Full Appropriations Committee, Congresswoman Nita Lowy from New York. Welcome. And I thank Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, for holding this hearing. Secretary Asa, thank you for joining us today. As you know, Chair DeLauro and I sent you a letter on February 4th requesting information on additional resources for the coronavirus. Despite urgent warnings from Congress and the public health community, it has taken weeks for the Trump administration to request these emergency funds while tens of thousands have become ill around the world. And I understand, well, as my colleague, Mr. Cole, has said, this may not be attributed to you, but here you are today, and I thank you. Worse still, the overall request is inadequate to effectively combat this threat. It is alarming that the administration is proposing to take money from one emergency to pay for another which would leave us more at risk for emerging diseases and is an irresponsible approach to combating what the WHO has said is a potential pandemic. House Democrats will move quickly to enact a robust package that will fully address this threat without jeopardizing other necessary programs. Now to the budget. Mr. Secretary, you and I have been able to work together on important public health issues, and I value our relationship. That's why it's so disappointing when you come before us with a budget that is really devoid from reality and would seriously harm the American people. President Trump's disastrous budget is filled with program cuts opposed by the public and bipartisan majorities in both chambers. It is unfortunate that instead of using the budget to build on the historic investments secured in last year's appropriation bills, the president doubled down on partisan talking points to propose investing $2 billion for the wall or steal it outright from our veterans and service members while proposing to cut initiatives that improve the well-being of Americans exposes the Trump administration priorities for what they are, campaign promises over public health. Among many reckless proposals, your budget would cut CDC CDC by nearly $700 million. Just as CDC is combating epidemics on opioids, surging rates of youth vaping. We could use a whole hearing, again, on just the youth vaping issue. I've never seen anything expand in all our public schools, even down to fourth, fifth, sixth grade. Um, one of the worst flu seasons in decades, and the coronavirus. A cut NIH by $3.3 billion, jeopardizing life-saving medical research, and eliminate preschool development grants, which would stall the important progress states have made to build strong early education systems. In addition, the irresponsible proposal to eliminate teen pregnancy prevention while assaulting Medicaid and attacking the foundation of Title X family planning with a domestic gag rule is a dangerous combination that will leave many women without access to quality care, result in more unplanned pregnancies. This is an assault on women's health and the rights of women and their doctors. And I was dismayed, actually shocked, with the elimination of the federal funding we included in the fiscal year 2020 spending bill for the first time in two decades for gun violence prevention research. While you have supported this research in the past, I want to say that again. I'm aware that you have supported this research in the past. The budget makes clear that the president does not intend to do anything to combat the gun violence epidemic in this country. In addition, rather than invest in the ability of state and local governments to combat the vaping epidemic, which has led to at least 64 deaths, nearly 3,000 hospitalization. This budget would consolidate CDC's Office on Smoking and Health, cut its funding at the very moment we need the CDC's expertise and resources. So if a budget is a statement of values, that it's clear that President Trump has no intention of protecting our young people 
or improving the health of Americans. But thank you so much for being here. I look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Uh, and I want to yield to the ranking member of the uh, Full Appropriations Committee, Congresswoman Kay Granger from Texas. Thank you so much. Uh, before I begin my pre prepared remarks on the crisis that we're dealing with right now, I want to associate myself with Ranking Member Cole's remarks having to do with your good job and the planning that's gone on in this, in this committee for such a long time. Uh, I'd like to thank Chairwoman DeLauro and Ranking Member Cole, who also serves as the Vice Ranking Member for the full committee for holding this hearing. I also want to thank you, Secretary Azar, for your efforts to protect our nation from this new coronavirus. Your immediate actions have enabled us to get ahead of the virus and begin protecting our citizens. At the beginning of the outbreak, you told members of Congress that you would let us know as soon as possible when more funding was needed, and you've done just that. I'm confident that Congress will work with you to make sure you have the resources in hand to continue to respond rapidly to this dynamic situation. All Americans should be reassured this morning that we have a robust public health system that's able to respond in every state to an infectious disease outbreak such as this. Congress has strengthened our state and local efforts with recent investments, including $85 million in the most recent fiscal year 2020 appropriation for a rapid response to an infectious disease. This is the very situation that led the subcommittee under the leadership of my friend Mr. Cole and uh, Chair uh, DeLauro to create such a fund, and I'm pleased to see that it's enabling your agency to mount a quick and proactive effort to keep our nation safe. I look forward to working with you and my colleagues in Congress as we continue to prevent the spread of this and other diseases within our country. I thank you for being here to testify today, and I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for your testimony. And as you know, your full testimony will be entered into the record, and now you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ch Chairwoman Lowy, uh, DeLauro, and Ranking Members Granger and Cole. Thank you very much for inviting me to discuss the President's budget for fiscal year 2021. I'm honored to appear before this committee for budget testimony as HHS Secretary for the third time especially after the remarkable year of results that HHS has produced in the last year. With support from this committee this past year, we saw drug overdose deaths decline for the first time in decades, another record year of generic drug approvals at FDA, and historic drops in Medicare Advantage, Medicare Part D, and Affordable Care Act exchange premiums. The President's budget aims to move toward a future where HHS programs work better for the people we serve where our human services programs put people at the center, and where America's health care system is affordable, personalized, puts patients in control, and treats them like a human being, not like a number. HHS has the largest discretionary budget of non-defense department agencies, which means that difficult decisions must be made to put discretionary spending on a sustainable path. This committee has made important investments over the years in some of HHS's large discretionary programs, including the National Institutes of Health, and we're grateful for that work. The President's budget proposes to protect what works in our health care system and make it better. I'll mention two ways we do that. First, facilitating patient-centered markets, and second, tackling key impactable health challenges. The budget's health care reforms aim to put the patient at the center. It would, for instance, eliminate cost sharing for colonoscopies, a life-saving preventive service. The budget would reduce patients' costs and promote competition by paying the same for certain services regardless of setting. And it endorses bipartisan, bicameral drug pricing legislation. The budget's reforms will improve Medicare and extend the life of the hospital insurance fund for at least 25 years. We propose investing $116 million in HHS's initiative to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity, and we propose reforms to tackle America's rural health care crisis, including telehealth expansions and new flexibility for rural hospitals. The budget increases investments to combat the opioid epidemic, including SAMHSA's state opioid response program, where we appreciate this committee's work with us to give states flexibility to address stimulants like methamphetamines. 
We request $716 million for the President's initiative to end the HIV epidemic in America by using effective, evidence-based tools. And this committee's support has enabled us to begin implementation already. Today, I'm pleased to announce that the Health Resources and Services Administration is dispersing $117 million in grants to expand access to HIV treatment and prevention by leveraging successful programs and community partnerships, such as the Ryan White HIV AIDS program and community health centers to reach more Americans who need treatment or prevention services. The budget reflects how seriously we take the threat of other infectious diseases, such as the novel coronavirus. By prioritizing funding for CDC's infectious disease programs and maintaining investments in hospital preparedness. We still have only 14 cases of the, of the novel coronavirus detected in the United States involving travel to or close contacts with travelers. We have three cases among Americans repatriated from Wuhan and 42 cases among American passengers repatriated from the Diamond Princess. The immediate risk to the American public remains low, but there is now community transmission in a number of countries, including outside of Asia, which is deeply concerning. We are working closely with state, local, and private sector partners to prepare for mitigating the virus's potential spread in the United States, as we expect to see more cases here. On Monday, OMB sent a request to make at least $2.5 billion in funding available for preparedness and response, including for therapeutics, vaccines, personal protective equipment, state and local public health support, and surveillance. I look forward to working closely with Congress on that request. Lastly, when it comes to human services, the budget cuts back on programs that lack proven results while reforming programs like TANF to drive state investments in supporting work and the benefits it brings for well-being. We continue the FY 2020 investments Congress made in Head Start and child care programs, which promote children's well-being and adults' independence. This year's budget aims to protect and enhance Americans' well-being and deliver Americans a more affordable, personalized health care system that works better rather than just spends more. And I look forward to working with this committee to make that common sense goal a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. And we're going to uh, step out of regular order for, for a moment. Uh, Chairwoman Roybal Allard is chairing a hearing at 1030. Uh, with the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so I want to say uh, thank you, uh, 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 you, you know, for, to my colleagues for your graciousness and uh, allowing Congresswoman Roy Allard to ask her question before she has to excuse herself. We recognize Congresswoman Roy Allard. Thank you, Madam Chair, and also thank you to uh, the committee for the courtesy of being able to, to speak out of order. Uh, Secretary Azar, since the initial passage in 2008 of my Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act, it has helped ensure high-quality diagnostics and life-saving follow-up interventions for the over 12,000 newborn babies diagnosed each year with genetic and endocrine conditions. As you know, the Newborn Screening Act codified the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children to help address the vast discrepancy <laughs> between the number and quality of state screening tests. Because of this committee's work, today 49 states and the District of Columbia screen for at least 31 of the 35 currently recommended core conditions. Last September, the reauthorization of the newborn screening law expired, and we have passed a new reauthorization bill in the House, and we continue to push our Senate colleagues to pass the bill out of their chamber. However, since October, your office has suspended the activities of the advisory committee, which is preventing it from completing its current work and commencing new business, including a critical update to the recommended uniform screening panel nomination process. Meanwhile, you have the authority reinforced in the 2014 newborn screening reauthorization to deem the advisory council a secretarial advisory committee so it can continue its charter. Given the essential role that the Advisory Council, Council plays in our nation's newborn screening system, why haven't you used this authority, and when will you extend the term of the committee until reauthorization occurs? Well, first, uh, Congresswoman, I'd like to thank you for your leadership with respect to maternal health and as co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on Maternity Care. 
As you know, maternal health is a very serious public health challenge in the United States, and our budget is actually investing in that thanks to your leadership and uh, both chairwomen of this committee, uh, by increasing funding by $74 million at CDC, HRSA, ARC, and IHS to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity. We're going to continue funding for maternal and child health block grants to states, which provide states with additional flexibility for programs such as heritable disorders. We also have $126 million for Healthy Start for community-based strategies to reduce disparities in infant mortality and improve perinatal outcomes for women and children in high-risk communities. With regard to the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders, due to that lapse in the authorization, uh, that committee has halted ex activities. I'm happy to look into the question of its, of its work as we work with Congress around reauthorization, of course, of the, um, uh, of the, of the Neonatal Screening uh, Act. Okay, because you do have that authority to, to continue uh, that committee. Uh, and you mentioned uh, another issue that I'm concerned about, that in your 21 budget you propose to eliminate the HRSA heritable disorder program and provides grants that provides grants to educate providers and parents and to help states expand their newborn screening programs. Without this funding, how will the states fulfill these newborn screening activities and improve follow-up care for infants diagnosed with heritable disorders, and who will operate, update, disseminate information from the federal clearinghouse of newborn screening information? Those are questions that, that I uh, would like some answers to, but you did mention that you also uh, rolled uh, the newborn screening into the maternal health, a child health block grant. Is that what you just stated? <clears throat> So, no, I was emphasizing that we have within the maternal mortality block, block grant that does provide addition that has flexibility to states for programs such as heritable disorders. So they could use that block grant funding, is my understanding, to continue while we're waiting for congressional reauthorization, work on heritable disorders. Well, well the, the concern is that, number one, you put less money into the block grant than was in the programs that you eliminated. And then states are free to use their block grant money as they desire. So increasing funding for the MCH block grant, uh, I think, is an important investment, but it does not guarantee the money will be spent on improving state newborn screening programs. So maybe we can work a little bit uh, on that and talk a little bit uh, more about the possibility of reinstating the committee. Advisory. Happy to work with you on that. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to return to regular order, and I have a question for you, um, Mr. Secretary. Uh, just before you testified yesterday morning before Senate Appropriations, OMB finally submitted a supplemental funding request. And uh, uh, Chairwoman Lowy mentioned uh, that we both asked you to submit such a request three weeks ago. And while we're glad the administration has finally done so, um, what, what has been provided to date is unacceptable. It lacks the fundamental components of a supplemental request, including proposed bill language, supplemental documentation, and OMB did not transmit a budget table with programmatic details until last night. To be clear, we want to be supportive. We realize this situation is evolving, and you are adjusting to shifting circumstances. But it is important for the committee to better understand the needs going forward. One, can you tell us how much of the Infectious Diseases Rapid Response Reserve Fund has been used for this emergency response. Has, so as, as I think you would, oh, sorry. Has the 105 yeah. million that was available from that fund been exhausted? Uh, we are at the point now where we have used or com where we have either committed or obligated the monies in that $105 million rapid response fund. Uh, and that's why I sent you the notice last night about the reprogramming and transfer on the 136 so that for future obligations we can continue our work. So that the 105 the is gone. Uh, it is by being in budget or obligated. committed or obligated. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, it's, right. It's, it, it, it's, it's not there. Right. Okay. Um, 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 and, and are you going to, uh, uh, how quickly are you expending the funds? Uh, the actual the actual run rate of the money going out the door, I don't know. I believe we were at about $20 million the last update we had given to the subcommittee, but I'd, I'd want to defer to staff if we could okay, well, we can check with you up. on that. I'm, okay. I, we'll I, I, I do want to make sure you're getting information on spend rate as quickly as OMB will, uh, you know, authorize the release of that. But I, we're basically, we're out of the 105, for which we're very grateful that you all funded. It's proven to be vitally, vitally important. 
So thank you. Let me ask you to provide uh, additional details of the supplemental request mm -hmm. for the subcommittee. Yep. I've only seen a two-page letter from OMB yep. and a one-page budget table. You know, I was around when the Obama administration uh, submitted a supplemental request for Ebola. They sent a 28-page document outlining the intended purpose of each component of the request, and that was demanded by this committee. I would, I, I, there, every time they came was much more information. So let me ask you these several questions. How do you intend to reimburse state and local agencies for their expenditures on the ground? So, um, so we've got, I appreciate your frustration with the two page, the two page letter being the documentation. We've been working with your staff to provide detail. By the way, this is yes. the Obama submission. Right. So we've been working with your staff. We actually do, we do have plans that we're gonna work with your teams to make sure we educate on and we work, work together to flesh out. It's a very fast moving process as I'm sure you understand. So the, within the $2.5 billion, at least $2.5 billion request, we would have the CDC have a major fund, which would be through the Public Health Emergency Fund, to allow them to work with state and local governments to reimburse for expenses around contact tracing, laboratory work, lab testing. We are testing, going to reimburse state and local agencies. Yes, yeah, so that would be that is that is the goal to have a fund that would enable the, the the feedback we've gotten from state and locals, whether through grants or actual reimbursement, and we'd work with the committee on the appropriate structure of how you think that should be done. Okay, and I would just like to know. Uh, what we think that is going to be, how much money is involved, yep. uh, et cetera, so that we can also Absolutely. respond. Yep. We're so all that, getting those questions. Yes. So that, that's in the table. So if there are five key areas that didn't, weren't quite transparent in the letter, if I could mention the, the key strategic Quickly, investments we want to make. Run out. Okay. okay, I'll get the five areas. How much of the funding is designated for international activities versus domestic preparedness? So I believe in the in the most recent document that I saw, the table that I believe you have access to, there is a two hundred million dollars in there of USAID funding that may be from existing sources. I don't know if that's new money or not. Um, that, that may be existing monies that would be dedicated on that. We have focused our $2.5 billion request at HHS, frankly, on US preparedness and response. And I would say compared to the Ebola response where getting that stopped in West Africa or now in East DRC is the yes. critical element. Here, our activities are really mitigation, containment and mitigation preparation in the homeland because we're not going to help the Chinese stop this in China. China's going to do that or not be able to do that. Does the supplemental request include funding to replenish the Infectious Disease and Rapid Response Reserve Fund? Yes or no? I don't believe we use the, the rapid response fund, but what we would do is work with you on the 2021 appropriation to ensure that that is appropriately funded in light of this. The funding request, of course, was locked in December before any of this happened. So we, we want to be flexible on 2021 funding to respond to this. Did OMB reject any of your requests for emergency supplemental funding to respond to the coronavirus? Well, I'm not going to get into back and forth with the White House or OMB discussions, but I, I want to let you know this $2.5 billion request, it has my complete and full support. Um, it attacks the five critical success factors that I made clear I needed to invest in, and it supports that. It's at levels I think are appropriate, and if not, if, the, if it doesn't fund it enough, we'll come back to you and work with you. And again, we're trying to be flexible. We said at least two five. We want to work with you on both funding sources as well as top line amounts. Well, as the chair pointed out, we will put together a supplemental that will address this issue. Congresswoman, uh, Congressman Cole. You gave me a promotion there for a minute. Uh, uh, I'm sorry? No, oh, actually, yeah, I know she's got to get to that. Yes, I, I apologize. Congresswoman Granger. Thank you for allowing me to go. I have to go to another one. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I was alarmed to learn recently that almost 90 percent of active ingredients used for pharmaceutical manufacturing <laughs> originate in China. What should we be doing in the United States to ensure the safety of the American drug supply? Well, uh, Chairwoman, as you, as you know, this is really, this has brought to light the issue of the complete internationalization of the supply chain, not just for medical products, but really across all of the economy. Um, and so what we're doing now is the FDA is reaching out to all pharmaceutical manufacturers, device manufacturers, et cetera, to make sure we've got visibility. The latest fruits of that work 
show that there are 20 pharmaceutical products we are aware of to date at FDA where either the entire product is made in China or there is a critical active ingredient that is solely sourced within China. So um, those would be obviously the most targeted to con be concerned about. Uh, to date, we are not aware of any expected shortages, and we have aggressively, proactively reached out to manufacturers for that information. Um, I'm told there are two manufacturers in Hubei province of pharmaceuticals, but fortunately the manufacturer has a large, large stockpile supply of advanced production there. But we have to be very alert to this, and we have to be candid that there could be disruptions in supplies. We already experienced that, of course, with medical, medical shortages, generic shortages, um, due, to, due to sole source producers, manufacturing defects, inspection problems. And we've got an aggressive agenda for shortages that we've worked with this committee and authorizing committees on to help alleviate shortages. Good. Would you thank you? And would you keep us informed? Of course. Those yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would like to recognize the chair of the committee who has a hearing. <laughs> You're very busy. I was busy, in the lobby. <laughs> We'll all talk fast. Thank you. Um, first of all, I echo the concerns raised by Chair DeLauro on the coronavirus. And we really do need these answers right away. But I'd like to turn to another matter on which is impacting public health. As you know, I've worked to restore funding for gun violence prevention since former Representative Dickey first attached his amendments to the spending bill more than 20 years ago. Some of us were there. The FY20 spending bill enacted uh, with bipartisan support in December included $25 million for federal gun violence prevention research split between the CDC and the NIH. And when you and I have discussed this issue, including at the budget hearing two years ago, you expressed support for this research and responded that we're in the science gathering business. Well, clearly, that sentiment isn't shared by the White House, as the President's budget would eliminate this groundbreaking funding. Nearly 40,000 Americans lose their lives due to a firearm each year. Hundreds of thousands more are injured. Why does the Trump administration not believe this is a public health priority worthy of funding? So thank you for having funded that in the 2020 appropriation in December. And we're actually executing on the funding both at NIH and at CDC. In fact, um, just on the 21st, the CD put out a new research funding opportunity, research grants to prevent firearm-related violence and injuries to solicit investigator-initiated projects uh, with deadline of May 5th for, for submissions of those. In terms of the budget submission and the continuation of that, as you know, with CDC's budget, we prioritized infectious disease preparedness and global health security. And so that did mean cuts and, cuts and prioritization away from chronic and preventive activities, which included the firearm research there. We, of course, continue at NIH to always be open for business, as we have always been for firearm research uh, within the peer review process of submissions. And uh, so well, that, would, that would continue apace regardless of whether Congress accepts the budget submission or not. Well, with all due respect, the administration chose to make these cuts. This wasn't a tough choice. It was the wrong choice. With limited time, I'm going to go to another key issue, and I thank you, Madam Chair. As I mentioned, at least 64 people died last year, and nearly 3,000 were hospitalized with vaping-related respiratory illnesses. While many but not all of these cases were attributed to vitamin E acetate, the crisis raises serious question about how little is known about vaping, particularly as concern grows that there could be long-term health consequences such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, and more. This is particularly alarming as the youth vaping rates have skyrocketed. So I was optimistic when President Trump said he would clear the market of flavored e-cigarettes. But after speaking to his political advisors, he turned his back on public health for political gain, and instead proceeded with an announcement that has left thousands of kid-friendly flavors on the market and allowed disposable e-cigarettes to flourish. How many more people will have to be sickened or die for the administration to take this seriously and ban all flavors? Uh, Chair one, thank you for your passion around the e-cigarette and vaping issue and access for kids. I share that and um, want to keep working with you on this challenge. Uh, when the President made the initial announcement that with me on September the 11th, 
Um, we included all flavors other than tobacco in that statement because at the time we had the National Youth Tobacco Survey data, which had mint and menthol together as a single category of use. We were actually at that time concerned about including menthol in the immediate removal from the market, given the fact that menthol combustible is a discrete legal category used, especially in the African American community, and want to make sure that off ramp would not be immediately pulled away from folks. After making our announcement, we got the monitoring the future data out of NIH that broke apart for the first time and showed that menthol was really not being used by kids. It was much more like tobacco flavoring of the e-cigarettes, and it was the mint that was driving it, and that was what led to the modification of the flavoring question there as we move forward to the submission deadline. We just also, with regard to disposables, we don't have data on disposables. Enjoy, the largest manufacturer, did pull their flavors off the market, is what, what they announced, the comparable kid-friendly flavors off of the market. But we're going to keep working and enforcing. If anybody's marketing to kids, we're going to enforce against them. We're going to watch the data in terms of enforcement priorities. Um, and of course, they all have to submit by May of 2020 per court order for the PMTA at FDA. Well. Just a quick final question. Frankly, we need more resources to combat this epidemic, not less. So maybe you can think about why the administration recommended yet again to consolidate and then gut funding for the Office on Smoking and Health. Uh, I guess I, oh, I guess I don't have any time. No. Why don't you think about that and perhaps answer? Um, just let me say in conclusion, Madam Chair, this is an epidemic. You know, I speak to my grandkids. Sixth grade, fifth grade, it is unbelievable what's going on out there. So we have to take it seriously, be tough and strong, and respond to this epidemic that's growing. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Member Cole. Thank you again for your... Absolutely. Thank you. Know. And uh, Madam Chairman of the full committee, you have all the time you want whenever you need it. <laughs> I'm sure oh, our yeah. chairman will make sure. <laughs> yes, you do. This is your committee. Uh, but I'm going to go over to Homeland Security. Okay. Well, we'll miss you because we know you're, we're really your favorite. Um, <laughs> and we always have been. Uh, let me start a uh, couple things. I want to uh, first associate myself very much with our chairman's uh, request for the additional detail on the supplemental. And, and that's meant to try and help you, quite frankly, because our job will be to sell the supplemental to our colleagues on both sides of the aisle. I know we'll work together to do that. So the more you can arm us with information, uh, the better off we'll be. I do have a couple of quick questions on the coronavirus. And, and I want to, again, my, my chairman made this point, and I want to associate myself with her on this, too. I agree with her about Ebola. Uh, you know, I don't think you should sacrifice short term here. What This is bad, dealing with coronavirus. If we ever had an Ebola outbreak inside the United States, it would be devastating. So I just don't think we should be uh, pound, uh, you know, penny wise and pound foolish on that. I, I would hope working together we protect that funding uh, going forward. And I just I say that just to advise you of that. And uh, again, I don't have any problem with people being prudent, trying to stretch the dollars as far as they can. That's a good thing. This is just one that I think we're going to have to do something different. Now, I want to ask one question, uh, and I know the answer to it, but I want to get it clearly on the record. If you do not have enough money, in the $2.5 billion you asked for, you will come back and ask for it, uh, additional funds. Is that correct? Absolutely. I can tell you I've talked to our leadership, and they are fully supportive of that. They understand that this is difficult uh, to estimate uh, and that it could grow exponentially. And so, I mean, I've got the green light from our side of the aisle to say, look, if we have to go beyond this, please feel free to alert your colleagues on the other side that we're going to work with you on that. Uh, second question, and again, a compliment. I want to thank you. We don't have the jurisdiction over funding on uh, the Indian Health Care Service, but you do. And uh, you had a modest increase in that this <laughs> year in a tight budget. I appreciate that, and thank you. And uh, we'll do my very best to give you more money than you asked for um, in that area. But I do want to also alert you, uh, your budget does... Um, proposed the elimination of the Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country program at the CDC. That ain't going to happen. Uh, you know, that, uh, that is a program that we work with tribal governments on. Uh, they're vastly underfunded in this particular area. Uh, and so, again, I, 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 I sympathize with you dealing with uh, OMB, uh, but I just alert you that uh, I certainly would be very opposed to that. 
you want to comment on some of the things you're doing in tribal health, I'd be very interested in uh, listening to what you have to say. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much. And uh, I think you know our passion, my passion around tribal health. And uh, we have, we have even in tight budget environments, we've really tried to ensure appropriate investment in, 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 in Indian, Indian country. Um, while our budget does, as, as everyone has noted, propose an overall decrease of almost 10 percent in discretionary spending, uh, IHS is, fu is funded in our budget request actually at $6.2 billion, which is a 3 percent increase. So just by scale, I think that reflects the prioritization of Indian health that we're trying to make here. Uh, discretionary funding for IHS has actually gone up by 24 percent between FY 2017 and 2020. Uh, we're working to improve quality, safety in our facilities. In fact, my deputy secretary is out there in South Dakota this week inspecting our facilities that we're trying to get brought up to certification. We're working to, as part of this appropriation, we want to really build up a whole quality safety culture and mindset throughout IHS beyond just compliance with CMS certification requirements. So that's part of all that we're trying to do for, for Indian Health. Well, Thank again, you. I'm very appreciative, and uh, we're going to work with you where we can and then occasionally stop you where we must. Uh, uh, but uh, let me move to another area, and you and I have talked about this recently, and I think it's important for the committee to know. We've had some very legitimate questions, in my view, about reimbursement, particularly during coronavirus for state and local people. But uh, the reality is uh, CDC provides, I think, 50 percent of all the funding for state and local health programs in the United States. I know my own state, it's 60 percent. Uh, so uh, it's not as if you haven't put a lot of effort out there already. And, uh, you know, this is something that maybe state and local governments need to be looking at. Not, not that I'm calling for any decrease in what we do, but maybe they need to be doing a little bit more themselves. But I want to ask you how ready you think these state and local departments are uh, to uh, deal with this as we go forward and what additional uh, uh, steps you think we ought to take to, to strengthen those uh, things without making them totally dependent on the federal government? Well, as you mentioned, thanks to this committee, we, through the CDC fund, approximately 50 percent of the public health infrastructure at the state and local level in the United States. In addition, uh, there is, or connected to that, is the Public Health Emergency Program, the FEP, which funds, over the last many years, $675 million a year to, to states to then give to locals to pre precisely for this kind of situation, to be ready for public health emergencies. Um, I have been impressed by most states and local governments' degrees of cooperation and preparedness, but it has also highlighted to me I believe there is a need for greater accountability and oversight with that money that's going out to ensure that it is, in fact, leading to readiness for a public health emergency. Last quick question, because I only have about 30 seconds, but uh, I probably get more concerns about mental health in my district than almost anything else. I think that's pretty common for all of us. Could you address quickly some of the things in your budget that would help us deal with the mental health problems that I know all of us face? Well, one of the most exciting things in our budget, from my perspective, is the proposal that would allow a state option on what's called the IMD exclusion, not just to have inpatient, expanded inpatient facility capacity for substance use disorder, but also for serious mental illness. To really, we've seen where we've had IMD exclusions approved for the waivers approved for states on substance use disorder, an expansion in capacity. And we, by bringing this as a state option, which means it's not, I think, subject to the budget neutrality issues of a waiver, um, that's a major investment could allow that for serious mental illness. Just, just one example there. Uh, Congressman Polkan. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, first off, let me say your department's in the final stages of a regulation regarding the, inop the interoperability of healthcare data. Uh, more than 10,000 of my constituents work in the health IT industry. I just wanted to let you know that the outcome of this rule is very important in my district. I appreciate you listening to the concerns uh, of comments. Look forward to the improvements that will happen um, in the regulation, and I want to thank you for your leadership. We've, we've, I've, I've, tried to, I've worked directly with EPIC leadership um, in hearing their concerns, and I think often they we put a proposal out, and we precisely because we want to get that feedback about operationalizing and everything. And so I hope that we're trying to be no, very look, reflective of look forward to those changes there as much as we can. So let me try to get to the the meat, which may not be as pleasant. I, I would love to get to um, talks about the cuts to Medicare and Medicaid, the cuts to NIH, but I really want to talk about coronavirus, and I need you to to help provide some comfort to the American people 
that this administration and uh, federal officials actually have a grasp on this. Because let me just go down a little bit of litany of what I found in the news just in the last few days. Um, we had the Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, yesterday say a vaccine was several months away. The president said we're very close to a vaccine. And yet I think you and the CDC and others have said it's more like 18 months. Uh, we have heard from Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross say that the coronavirus could be good for U.S. business because it hurts China. We have heard Larry Kudlow say it's contained. We have heard uh, Rush Limbaugh, a Medal of Freedom uh, winner and White House surrogate, say it's no worse than the common cold. Uh, and yet we've also heard uh, from CDC officials not a question of this, if this will happen anymore, but rather a question of exactly when. And Dr. Fauci, who many of us uh, really respect, said it's inevitable this will come to the United States. So we've got those kind of comments. Second, uh, we know that this first started information coming around January 7th uh, in the budget that was produced by the president on February 10th. Uh, provided a number of cuts that would have actually worked to uh, directly affect this from the almost 700 million cuts to CDC, 167 million from the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, 18 million from the Hospital Preparedness Response Account, and 200 million cut to Project BioShield. Uh, we have seen uh, recent reporting that 150 prescription drugs, and this is from the FDA, are at risk of shortage if this outbreak worsens, and yet the FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn is reportedly not part of the task force that is planning the U.S. response to coronavirus. Uh, in 2018, the CDC cut 80 percent of its efforts as part of the Global Health Security Initiative to prevent global disease outbreaks because it was running out of money and it was reported that the department could go from working in 49 countries to just 10 countries. Also in 2018, uh, the White House official that was responsible for leading the U.S. response uh, of the deadly pandemic uh, left the administration and the global health security team he oversaw was disbanded. Uh, and um, finally, uh, the tweet from this morning from the president uh, talking about low rating fake news, uh, doing everything possible to make the coronavirus spelt incorrectly, but I'm a journalism major, uh, look as bad as possible, including panicking markets if possible, markets being the concern. So help me, is this contained, the common cold, inevitable, two months, 18 months? Provide me some security that someone knows what's going on in this administration about the coronavirus. Well, thank you. Where shall I begin? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long list of uh, um, So. Um, uh, what we're trying to do, and we've tried to do this with members of Congress, Senate, and the public and the media, is really flood you with information about this to make sure that we're being transparent about what we're facing, what we know and what we don't know, as well as what our plans are. So um, the risk right now is very low to Americans. Um, we have, we have and as, Kudlow, as, as Larry Kudlow said, from a public health perspective, we technically are in a state of containment in the United States. We have had 14 domestically identified cases here from non-repatriation. That has remained the case now for 15 days. But we have always been clear that, number one, that could change rapidly. And from the outset, I and the public health experts have said, we fully expect we will see more cases here in the United States. We have to be mentally prepared and also as a government so prepared. If I can, just to reclaim my time. I it still didn't provide me the comfort I was looking for. I, I, because the variety of statements I said are from two months, it's nothing, it's a common cold, to inevitable. And I, I still don't think this, this administration seems to have grasp on it. Let me ask you this. You're, you're looking for the funds. You wonder, I also agree with the bipartisan uh, concern around stealing it from Ebola. I talked to a senior White House official last year, one of his two main, not White House, but administration official, one of his two main concerns he was dealing with was Ebola. So taking money from that would be ridiculous. Let me ask you this. We have redirected $3.8 billion from defense for the wall. Um, the wall is not going to stop any real or imaginary migration, and it's certainly not going to stop the coronavirus. Would you be supportive of taking some of that $3.8 billion or any money for the wall and transferring it to take care of the coronavirus? So the, the Ebola funding and, the tr and all of the transfers proposed in the supplemental, I do want to be very clear, that is simply a concept of how you could fund half of the supplemental. We are not wed to that. We wanted to give you ideas. On the Ebola money, um, that in particular uh, with the Ebola, it is thanks to the Ebola supplemental funding we had before, it's, it's important to note, we have now an approved vaccine from Merck, 
and we now have two therapeutic candidates. I've been almost daily involved with the Eastern DRC Ebola outbreak that, <laughs> God willing, is coming close to being under control. It's certainly on the epidemiological curve is looking more like that if the security situation stays. But I want to thank this committee for the support on Ebola um, that we've had. And we have now major weapons to use against Ebola, which is which is really a revolution. And if I could, Madam Chair, just to the specific last part of the question, would you be uh, – okay with uh, taking funds that have been redirected for the wall and redirecting to stop coronavirus? I don't believe the administration would be supportive of that, but Congress will make the decisions about how to fund any supplemental. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I want to uh, uh, commend you for your initiatives on advancing kidney health. Um, most people don't know that 750,000 uh, Americans uh, – have a irreversible kidney failure, um, and 90 percent of CKD patients are undiagnosed. So nine in 10 people do not know <laughs> that they're on this track. Uh, it represents, uh, it, so then it's too late to slow the disease progression. So that's, um, it, Medicare spends more than 120 billion, 34 percent of total spending, uh, and it, it the and NSAGE disease accounts for 7% of Medicare spending, despite representing 1% of Medicare patients. And this is only going to get worse. So my hat is off. I've been super excited about the initiative that the White House that you are, have launched um, to go after several of the problems within our current system, both to educate and inform and, and help people become more healthy, also to make sure that we're getting more solid organ procurements, that people are getting uh, the transplants needed. And you're also going after um, the, the big fear for most people who have transplants, which is when is the, uh, the, the immunosuppressive coverage going to end? Because I can't afford that. And so I just want to say thank you. It's a breath of fresh air to have someone really taking on this issue. Um, it represents a lot of hope for a number of us who have been laboring in this field. Um, I wanted to ask, there's two things, you know, I have a lot of questions about the coronavirus and I do appreciate, I've seen multiple options uh, for members to come for briefings from your staff, from your team. So thank you for keeping us abreast. I do think it's going to change and iterate, like you said. Um, I wanted to see if someone from your office would be willing to come in and just sit down with me uh, about some real specific questions. Um, how does it jump? What, what test kits are being, being made ava available locally? I saw something about commercial test kits becoming available. Um, I think if, if it does iterate and it becomes communicable in, in you know, each of our communities, we don't know how really our public health agencies and even our hospitals need to be able to test. That's what, that's what we're going to need. Um, I know they keep saying it's only 2% uh, of people die with this as compared with SARS, but those 2% represent the elderly. I mean, every, almost every article I've read, it's, it's someone 70 years or older, um, or it's someone with a chronic illness, and I think we should be defending those folks to the best of our ability. So I know we probably don't have the time to go into that now, but I'd just love somebody to come in and spend a little bit of time with me on that, if that's... We'd be happy to try to do that, or if we could address those, because those are questions everybody has, and so that might well, be. Well, if you want to take a quick our, swing, swing yeah. at it, um, so in terms two, of three, the, let me let me give yeah. you the three. How yeah. does it spread? Right. Is it on tabletops? How long does it sit there? How does it jump? And the test kits and their availability. Right. So, in terms of transmissibility, mm -hmm. obviously, as a respiratory illness, it usually would 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 transmit versus aerosolization, um, but. Uh, there might be fomite, it's called fomite transmission when it would sit on a hard surface, for instance. Um, Dr. Fauci has spoken publicly about this, that of course we don't have hard data with regard to the novel coronavirus, but usually one would expect fomite transmission in the several hour range as opposed to multiple day range. But again, we don't, know. we don't have studies on this or data on this. That would be the usual with a coronavirus, but that's, I'd rely on Dr. Fauci mm -hmm. on that. Um, in terms of fatality rates, we're seeing various estimates. The WHO team that was just in China uh, saw higher rates of fatality, I think over 2.5 percent in Wuhan, but outside of Hubei province, I believe they were seeing numbers closer to 0.7 percent. Mm -hmm. So there again is a range, and we're going to one of the number the top projects for us is to get a set of public health. Uh, statements of our beliefs, what is the fatality rate we believe would be applicable in a modern healthcare system like the mm -hmm. United States with very aggressive active containment at the outset as well as community mitigation efforts in the event of community spread here. Um, so it might be, might be quite different than that in terms of uh, assumptions. On testing, uh, we currently have the CDC test, which they invented in one week, 
that is at CDC and, and is now validated at 11 other sites. We had an issue on the third stage of, the, there's, a, there's a third stage of the test. One of the 92 reagent aspects of it, if it's, if it's not done just right, was having issues on quality control on the control element, not leading to false positives or negatives, just an inconclusive result on one of the 92. We're working on both fixing that, but also perhaps we've over-engineered that test in the first two stages of it may actually be enough to enable a faster test. So we're working on getting that as soon as possible to the remaining public health labs. The commercial sector is looking at, we hope, the bedside diagnostics, as you said. We've heard from dozens and dozens of them, and the FDA will obviously expedite work with them on good, that. Good. Um, I know I can't ask you more questions, but would, could someone, I'd also like to talk about the pharmaceutical uh, slowdowns. I realize, you know, the immunosuppressives. There's some other things that are happening both in India and China, China impacting India with regard to shortages that have started, that we are seeing, that is leading to some of the major uh, pharmacies, retail pharmacies and mail order pharmacies. I don't want to use, um, they're, they are being judicious in how they're, they're filling scripts. I only see that Getting worse. I would say just to just to clarify for the public, sh those would be our general shortage issues that are not connected to the novel coronavirus. I would like because we have not seen yes. any shortages connected to. I this. don't want to yeah, incite right. any fear here, exactly. but I would like someone to come in and talk with me about. I just want to know what the sure. contingencies are yep. and 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 some some forward planning. So with that, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Frankel. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Just. I, I want to talk to you about something that I think is actually the, one of the greatest health issues here um, in this country. For, I, I, but I want to say for the record, and then I think my colleagues will follow this up, uh, the public should know that Mr. Trump fired the government's entire pandemic response chain of command uh, while, while in the White House. So, but I, I'm not going to get into that. I want to ask you a question, a couple questions. Would, would you agree doctors should not lie to their patients? Doctors should provide truthful information to their patients. All right. There's one. Uh, and doctors, as doctors should give full information to their patients. All right. I know. Uh, you said doctors should not lie to their patients. Yes. I agreed with that. Okay. They should give full information. If they're in a statutory system that precludes certain information or certain communications, then they have to comply with statutory oh, Okay. Let's get that. So, what, <laughs> so, so let's talk about the contradiction, uh, really, of those two statements, because I'm going to talk about Title IX. Uh, I, I'm sure you anticipated that. And listen, I also want to say thank you for being here. Excellent. Okay. Ten. Title X. That's right. I can't even read my own paper. <laughs> All right. So the Trump budget, Title X, uh, you keep it stable funding, $286 million. Uh, and I want to say something about Title X. It, it has in the past been a bipartisan and very incredibly effective program. And it's meant to ensure people who are struggling to make, make ends meet, who don't have health insurance, they can still have access to birth control, cancer screenings, STD testing, and, and treatment, as well as annual exams. Unfortunately, in March of 2019, HHS uh, published a rule which prohibits providers from pro providing referrals for abortion even upon a per patient's request and impose onerous physical and financial separation requirements uh, which under uh, rule, all abortion activities must be physically and financially separated. So let me just say this. I call this the Trump abortion obsession. Uh, so e for example, even if a patient who came into a Title X provider said, uh, found out they were pregnant and had asked, uh, do I have an alternative? Uh, whether I keep this pregnancy or not, the provider is not allowed to tell them. Not allowed to say. They are gagged, G-A-G-G-E-D. They're gagged. Uh, because of this, uh, Planned Parenthood announced it would leave the program, and uh, unfortunately, the, the courts have upheld the um, administration's rule. Planned Parenthood uh, served 1.5 million of the four million Title X patients. And I'm just to go, I'm not going through all these statistics, uh, but half the patients who rely on Title X funding would, do not have the provider they ha had been turning to. 
I want to ask you this. Do you have a list, or could you provide us with a list of the new providers that have come into the program? I believe we could. I, okay. I, I, think I would like to. Do you happen to know how many, of, how many new providers there are? Um, the number of new, I'm just looking to see if I happen to have that here. I don't believe I have just the exact number of new providers, but we could get that for you. Okay. Well, well, would it have surprised you that as of, as of, as of one year after the rule was uh, published, there had only been one new provider, and uh, or maybe, and the provider did not provide contraceptive services. Well, actually, the the provider had. I, I know the entity you're speaking of. That provider has to, through their subgrantees, have have subgrantees that would provide the full range of contraceptive services required under Title Ten. And there are several states that have no Title Ten funding right now. Well, you know, I could go on and on about this, but. Um, let me ask you another question. Who, who, should who should decide whether or not someone brings a child into this world? Who is in the best? Should someone have to call the governor or call you or call me? So with regard to Title X, yes. we are enforcing the Title X law, which by Congress prohibits referral for abortion as a method of family planning, and our final rule actually well, was upheld even by the Ninth Circuit. Abor abortion, abortion is a medical service that is legal. It's legal, is that correct? Congress decides where federal money may be used in connection with abortion, and so the federal the statute in Title Ten prohibits referral to programs in which prohibits referral. I for I, I do understand that, and as as a result, because we, it's what is called as a gag rule, which means providers cannot give their patients all the information they need to make important decisions. You have lost the biggest provider in the country, which is called Planned Parenthood. Are you aware that Planned Parenthood uh, does a lot more than refer to abortions or provide abortions, STD exams, mammograms? So I'm actually aware that between 2020 and 2010 and 2015, 141 Planned Parenthood clinics have closed, that over the past nine years, cancer screening and prevention services at Planned Parenthood declined by over 60 percent, contraceptive services declined by 30 percent, and there and important preventive activities like HPV vaccinations and well woman exams account for less than ten percent of their activities as they focus oh, okay. on their wait, abortion wait work. How, how, hun, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of patients are taken care of by were taken care of by Planned Parenthood. Mammograms, STDs, contraception. You need to check all right, sorry about that. Uh, I would say you should go back to school. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for the uh, being here with us today and for the update on the coronavirus and the regular briefings that you and the administration and the team have been doing. <laughs> also want to thank you for all you are, and your team are doing kind of around the clock on this, so appreciate that. Um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about um, some of the initiatives you're doing in the rural health space. I know you have a a four-point strategy. Um, a few specific areas I wanted to talk about. One is the opioid situation, you know, and overdoses uh, of opioids. Um, that's a huge concern in my district. And, and I know naloxone is used in kind of the front lines on this to uh, help people. And I wondered what the HHS is doing to help create an awareness uh, with the general public, as well as work with pharmacists to make sure it's accessible and available. And then anything you can do to help us, you know, understand the insurance aspects as well to keep costs down for people. Sure, sure. So, Congressman, with regard to um, rural health and the opioid crisis, um, I did want to mention that we've got consistent funding of $23 million for the first responders training program. Um, which actually trains first responders in opioid overdose in rural communities. Uh, we have the Project AWARE Rural Set-Aside. We have the Rural Health Outreach Grants Program, which maintains $80 million, consistent funding there to support grants for primary care opioid use disorder treatment and prevention and behavioral and behavioral services there. In terms of naloxone, um, 
With naloxone, we've actually seen the genericization of that product. So that we've seen a four as a raw 405 percent increase in naloxone prescribing. We've got the in 2019 FDA approved the first ever generic naloxone. We've granted priority review to every other naloxone product that um, that would that would be used for emergency treatment. Um, and we also are encouraging over-the-counter um, by laying out what would be needed to do an OTC of naloxone also. So we've seen pricing. I think at this point with CMS, uh, with Part D, we've encouraged placement on the select care tier for naloxone, which would be $0 copay. And I think we're seeing similar types of support in commercial insurance also. Yeah, I, thank you. And I uh, also want to talk a little bit about telehealth, if we could. Um, that uh, it's very important in these rural communities, and I just wondered if you could discuss how your proposed changes to Medicare fee for service uh, advance payments will broaden access to Medicare telehealth services. Absolutely. So we've got in the budget several proposals. One of them would be to modernize Medicare telehealth so that it would promote value-based payments. So removing barriers to telehealth in rural and underserved areas by expanding the availability and fee for service where we have advanced payment models. So those APMs, making sure telehealth is available in fee for service. So that's one. The next is to enhance our services in federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics. So that would allow these centers to actually be distant site providers in rural America, which would make them eligible for payment under Medicare fee-for-service as part of that proposal. And we would also extend Medicare telehealth for IHS and tribal facilities. As, as we know, IHS is, of course, one of the most important rural health care providers sure. that we have in America. Sure. Wonderful. Um, if I could take you to the CDC for a minute. I know uh, the CDC surveillance data platform. Can you talk, give us an update on the status of of that and plans going forward? So we've got one of the finest uh, surveillance platforms in the United, in, in the world in terms of CDC's support of this. And in fact, one of the, one of the critical elements of the emergency supplemental uh, is to enhance that surveillance system for novel coronavirus. What, I'd, what I want to get to is where we're getting data on suspected flu cases nationwide and getting those tested for novel coronavirus nationwide. We're, we've expanded that immediately to six cities, so Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Honolulu, Chicago, and New York currently have this enhanced surveillance. We want an early detection system because, because this will be the backbone of our effective mitigation program. We're also something I'm quite interested in. We've talk, we're talking with Google and others about how can we leverage novel IT social media interactions as part of a modern epidemiological surveillance system? They may know things faster than we can get public health reports in from local, local health agencies. And are, are we on track on these things? I know there's reports that are due to you and to Congress. Are we... I don't know about any partic particular reporting issues on, 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 on that, but um, if we get the supplemental, obviously we're going to use transfer money immediately to try to enhance that surveillance system uh, and then working on the rest of these initiatives. There are particular questions I'd be, we'd be happy to get back to you on any timing or deadlines. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, um, Mr. Ranking Member, and thank you, Mr. Secretary. Real quick thing, I think we have a six degree of separation relationship. You clerked for uh, Scalia. His aunt, who was very, very proud of him, was my both French and Spanish teacher. <laughs> and he comes from Trenton. <laughs> um, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions, and I have some questions regarding New Jersey specific. Number one is that you were quoted as saying we have a 30,000 stockpile of masks, and if there's a real pandemic, we need 300,000. And since we generally see products of that nature come out of China, where, we, where will we get ours and be prepared? Well, thank you. And uh, first, I'd like to actually clarify something that I said yesterday in the Senate Appropriations Committee. I had been informed um, of some information that's a bit different than what I had at the time to clarify. First, we have more masks than the 30 million that I related yesterday. We, but we have a different mix of those masks than what we had been informed of. So we have 30 million surgical masks. Those would be the gauze type, tie behind the ear type uh -huh. masks, meant to really protect people from the healthcare right. worker spreading. 
we have 12 million N95 NIOSH certified masks in the stockpile, and then we have about 5 million N95 masks that I believe may have expired. They're no longer NIOSH certified, uh -huh. so they wouldn't so be. So where do we get the rest? That and we then need? we would need, and so what we've talked about is approximately 300 million additional N95 masks right. from the emergency supplemental. We've already, from the reprogramming, but where we, will we get well, them? Well, so from the from the reprogramming, we're going to initiate immediately procurements to do domestic manufacturing right. around N95 as quickly as we can scale it up. And then if we get the emergency supplemental money on the strategic national stockpile, that would add on to those contracts. Um, it will be, I do want to caution, it will take time because China, as you met, rightly mentioned, China does yeah. co does control a lot of the raw materials as well as manufacturing capacity. Thank you. Thank you. I need to ask you some uh, New Jersey-specific questions because New Jersey has been designated a funnel airport, which means that individuals who are contagious or could possibly con be contagious could possibly be contained or, or quarantined in New Jersey. So I'm, I'm interested in sort of the costs associated with our responsibility uh, to do that, and I know New Jersey is gearing up for that purpose. What do you think is an appropriate and fair model to reimburse the states for costs that might be incurred over incidences like that, including uh, a quarantine facilities, um, test kits, over uh, overtime, service, that kind of thing? Yeah. So um, uh, first, with regard to the emergency supplemental, that's ex exactly why we're asking for a large amount of money to help state and local governments with larger scale containment activities. With regard to the particular issue of New Newark Airport as one of the funneling airports, that means individuals who've been in China within the previous mm. 14 days would be directed by DHS into Newark and others. Uh, we've worked very collaboratively with New York, which if we if we have any cases that required actual quarantine, New York has taken those on out of the Newark airport, New York. Um, and then the others really aren't an impact, shouldn't be an impact on New Jersey because at this point, because we're screening them with CDC and DHS people for health screening, and then the rest of the people are going on. We've screened, I believe, total about 46,000 travelers and have yielded only, I believe, 17 nationwide who've so, actually needed to go into quarantine because they were in Hubei province. Okay, then let me clarify something from my own self. That they are being, um, uh, that they're being uh, brought in and looked at in uh, Newark, there is no, there is no provision or no discussion about those individuals who need quarantining being on, on like the Joint uh, McGuire Air Force Base. Which is I, in southern, which is more southern I don't, New Jersey. I I don't believe so, but I'm I, I, I'm happy. I, I certainly can be corrected on that, and we would get you updated information. My understanding yeah. was that what we worked out was that Newark would funnel that any patients with Newark were going to New Jersey. But Newark, let me let me get to you York, that because I yeah, to New York. I'm sorry because yeah. I okay. let me let me get. I want to make sure please, I'm right about. Yeah, would you please? Newark. Because I understand that that's going to okay. um, allowing that is going to expire on March the fifth. But if there's going to be this need, we need to know. I, what the emergency response is going to be to, to okay. be that. Sure. I'll, I, I want to make sure I get you accurate information. If I could just, we'll call your office after the hearing to mm -hmm. get you. Um, I, th I think that um, Ms. Frankel asked, a, uh, made a comment about sort of the organization of uh, the administration's response uh, to pandemic um, uh, diseases and things of that nature. And I was wondering why we don't have a quote-unquote czar and why this uh, administration is not organized in a way that there is um, a person at the top who represents sort of the policies and has um, some authority. Because I know we had a, a pushback between the CDC and the State Department in terms of flying individuals who were contagious on the airline. So why don't we have that structure? What is the... What is a plan to have such a structure, and is there a plan to have such a czar? So Thank un you, Madam Chair. We so under adopt. the national, if I, if I might, under the national response plan, emergency support function eight for public health emergencies. I am the lead. My mine is the lead agency. I actually helped build these plans <laughs> decades ago, decades ago for pandemic preparedness and after 9/11. 
Um, so I serve as the lead on this um, while it's a public health emergency. Uh, I work on a daily basis with the chief of staff and the president. And so if there's any deconflicting of agencies needed, that can happen there. So we effectively get that same function. And it's just the longstanding doctrine that this should be led by HHS with a public health emergency. There's not actually a change. The oddity was actually what President Obama did with the Ebola response. I don't know why they felt things weren't working and needed to do that. Um, this has been the smoothest interagency process I've experienced in my 20 years of dealing with public health emergencies. Congressman Harris. Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, after hearing your testimony, you know, the, imp the inference that no one in the administration knows about coronavirus is pretty stunning. Uh, your knowledge is actually as up-to-date as you can get about it. Um, I will tell you, the other fake news is, is the budget uh, is referred to as cuts to Medicare and Medicaid. And, you know, the first time I heard that, I went, I went back and looked at that budget document. Medicare and Medicaid spending go up every single year in the president's budget, don't they? So only in Washington, that's a rhetorical question, I know what the answer is. So only in Washington is an increase called a cut. I'm not sure I understand it, but we'll leave it at that. Let's talk about the emergency funds. You know, I haven't been aware of anything that could be done here in the United States that hasn't been done. Let me bring a couple of examples. For instance, we've heard, we know that Moderna, I think, just yesterday shipped their, uh, their novel vaccine six weeks after the idea of making a vaccine. It shipped for a phase one trial to NIH. Moderna, by the way, is an American company, isn't it? It is, right outside is. of Boston, right? Absolutely. This is stunning, and this, and this lays on the framework uh, that the ranking member had mentioned over the years of us dealing and preparing for exactly this kind, of, this kind of potential crisis. I mean, that's stunning. That six weeks from conceptualization to shipping a phase one vaccine is stunning, and I would urge that uh, you and the department to speed that through the phase three trial hopefully to get it here before the next winter season. Uh, another American company, uh, Gilead uh, Remdesivir, uh, is developing a novel approach to an antiviral that could be effective in coronavirus. That's, pr that's pretty good, I think. Uh, so we've, we've incentivized, and it's amazing that the two companies that have taken the lead in a pharma pharmacolo pharmacologic approach to dealing with this are American companies. Now, I'll tell you what is disappointing. The president has warned us that China is a bad actor. Do we yet have the genotypes from China of the, of the, of the first cases of, of this uh, virus, viral I, disease? I, I do not believe we have the first we, generation isolates or genetic sequence. That's right. And that's a real problem because, you know, we can talk about what this country can do. But, you know, when you're talking about DNA sequencing or, R or mRNA sequencing of a vaccine, it depends on an accurate genotype. That, that China is unwilling to share with the United States. Now, I don't know why they're unwilling to share. You can use your imagination why they're, they're, they might be unwilling to share. But to hold the President of the United States responsible for the behavior of China in response to this is unconscionable. It's unconscionable. And I pick up the newspaper, and that's all I hear, and you may, you've heard some of it today in the subcommittee. No one's talking about China's role withholding the genetic sequencing of those initial isolates. Exceedingly important to figure out how this uh, disease is going, to, is going to affect Americans ultimately. All right, but there are other things, and I just want to, uh, you know, congratulate you for, for your support of BART. I know, as you know, Sanofi and J&J &J making two other novel uh, vaccines under the BARDA program. Again, we've thought about this in advance. We've done what we needed to do, and uh, I believe that... Uh, that we're on the track to dealing with this. But there are other issues that are important to me, and I don't have the time to ask in-depth questions. Maternal mortality, very important. I was a obstetric anesthesiologist. You know, I, I've, I've uh, seen patients get very, very ill. Fortunately, knock on wood, I haven't seen a, uh, a mother die. Uh, but it happens in the United States, happens more often than it should, and I applaud you for uh, uh, doing things about it. Antimicrobial resistance, incredibly important. And, uh, by the way, as we uh, begin, to, uh, begin uh, strategies to fight coronavirus, we have to realize that the antivirals, uh, I was the, I unaware of this actually until very recently, that uh, viruses develop resistant antivirals too. It's not just, it's not just bacteria. So uh, increasing uh, or keeping the drug pipeline for antivirals open and working is, is very, very important. Uh, one thing that I've, uh, I would ask you to look into, I've asked this for a year and a half, is uh, Medicare still does not pay for oxygen therapy for cluster headaches. 
And as I've told, uh, uh, you know, the CMS administrator, I had cluster headaches. Oxygen worked for me when I was younger. Uh, we should not deny it to Medicare patients. It, it, it's a serious disease. You shouldn't deny it. Uh, DIR fees, you know, I'm a little disappointed that, that, we, that the administration hasn't taken action on them. Uh, you know, the, the, the rebating mechanisms and, and what happens uh, uh, helps, draw, I think, drive up the cost of pharmaceuticals. Uh, I would ask you to uh, take action on it. Uh, I think we have, to, we have to come up, and this is one of the most frequent questions I get asked in a town hall meeting, is, is what are we going to do about prescription drug prices? I would suggest that, that instead of uh, uh, separating into, into our opposing camps, as you always do, let's get together and, and agree on some common things uh, that we can do. Uh, finally, uh, naloxone, in, incredibly important to, to make sure that, as we know and is true in my district, uh, the number of overdoses continues to rise or, or your plateaus. Number of deaths, fortunately, has gone down, I think, mostly to the availability of naloxone. So I want to thank the, the uh, department for what it's done with that. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Congresswoman Bustos. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for, for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. So I come from the state of Illinois where we've actually had uh, some cases of coronavirus. And I actually want to um, shift my line of questioning, um, not so much just around appropriations, even though we're uh, here at our Labor H subcommittee of uh, appropriations, but but more about um, preparing communities. Um, I about about 85 percent of the towns I represent are 5,000 people or fewer, 60 percent or 1,000 people or fewer. So a lot of uh, small and rural areas, and um, with the um, expected increase in cases that um, we've learned about, um, what will you and your department do to help prepare our local? health providers uh, to be ready for this. Yeah, and Congresswoman, first, thank you for your leadership on rural health and really appreciate you coming over and, and meeting with me. I appreciate you having me. Passwords. It was very nice of you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of rural communities and rural hosp hospitals and providers in the coronavirus situation, um, first, uh, we don't know how broad any spread would be. Um, we prepare for community outbreaks. Those could be really localized and then taking mitigation efforts. Um, Dr. Ann Shuket, who's the top career official at CDC yesterday, at our press conference, she tried to clarify one of the impressions, misimpressions that people have had from our current active containment efforts. Because right now we're bringing people back from China or from Japan, repatriating them, and they may be positive. We're in active containment. We are using high-end health facilities like Ebola treatment centers as really isolation units for them, even though they don't require that level of medical care because we're in an active containment. We don't have another place for them to be. So the impression, I think, is getting created that anybody who gets novel coronavirus not only goes to the hospital, but also goes to a very intensive type um, uh, negative airflow facility, which our rural communities don't have. Right. Um, in fact, what she said is most people who would get novel coronavirus are going to stay at home. They're going to treat it the way they would treat a severe flu or a cold, managing symptoms, and we will publish clear information when you should seek medical attention, when you, might you go to the hospital for the rarer instances where that would be required. So part of it is really managing that patient flow so we don't collapse our rural hospitals unnecessarily. Um, so it's really important that we all work together to educate the public and, and providers about that. So it's really no different in rural America than urban America. It's just educating the public on, on how best to treat this rather than head to the, the biggest hospital. That's right. Don't race. It's not going to be racing to the emergency room, right? But, we, but also the state and local support in the SUP will, of course, be really important for, for our hospitals and local public health agencies. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let me shift uh, the discussion that we had when I was in your office back in November, um, and that was about uh, health care provider shortage. So um, it, I'll give you a, a, an example in, in the congressional district that I serve. We have a county, it's called Henderson County, where uh, the patient to physician ratio is 6,995 patients to one physician. Um, that contrasts, like if you look at uh, Cook County, in our largest county in Illinois, we're, uh, you know, Chicago area, the, the ratio there is 1,200 to one. So um, and then you've also have these example. Uh, we we have a hospital that literally took seven years uh, to recruit a physician. So um, and we and we talked a little bit about this before. But um, so uh, we worked together, um, our uh, my colleagues and I, uh, in last year's funding bill to direct uh, the Health Resources Services Administration to provide a report to um, our committee within 120 days of how. Uh, how uh, recruitment could be better handled um, to, to address these provider shortages. 
Um, and so um, I did note that in the president's budget, uh, his proposal is to cut the health care workforce program by $824 million, or about 50 percent. And so I was just wondering how your department will square that massive cut with ending provider shortages, or at least addressing provider shortages, especially in rural America. Yeah, so I, I understand your, your concern and your question. The, the program that we fund there is the National Health Service Corps, which really lets us, through tuition reimbursement, get people, who nurses, doctors, dentists, um, through, a tu through a reimbursement system to serve in rural communities and underserved areas. The other program, the one you mentioned that we propose cutting, it doesn't have demonstrable results in terms of producing that kind of service in rural and underserved areas. It more goes to institutions as subsidies around teaching. The other thing that we want to do is reform our graduate medical education program. That's why we, we advocate combining the Medicare, Medicaid, and children's graduate medical education programs and getting rid of the caps that we had from the 1990s that freeze in place specialties so that we can enhance our our primary care doctors that we produce and psychs and other underserved specialty areas to get them into rural areas. That's part of the plan also. Okay, I have like several follow-up questions. I can get those to you of later because I'm out of town, uh, of out of time right now, but uh, thank you for, for being here and thanks for your answers. Congresswoman Lee. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and also to our ranking member and thank you, Mr. Secretary. A couple of questions. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, follow up on the uh, N95 masks. Uh, last week, I came through the international terminal from the Bay Area in San Francisco, and I noticed uh, quite a few people had masks on, but they weren't N95. The reason I knew this is because of the fires in the Bay Area, and uh, I have an aunt who's 99 years old, and uh, and also some senior centers where uh, the, they were wearing masks. But come to find out, they were useless in many respects. So, and that's how I learned about N95, and there was only one um, place where I could purchase them. Wanted to ask you how uh, you're rolling out the public education just with regard to which masks are the appropriate ones to use and which ones are not. Because when I entered um, the terminal last week, no one had an, an N95 yeah. mask on. Yeah. And so how, how are we uh, reaching out and letting the public know the difference between the masks and which ones to use? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked about that. We just we just need to use avenues like this and then when we have press conferences and all because I, I do fear, especially given that this is coming out of Asia where there is much more of a culture of mask wearing when one is sick or at risk of being sick, that people do have the sense of the mask is like the be-all, end-all of either preparedness or response activities. It's, it's an element in our armamentarium, mostly for healthcare workers. And that's that N95 mask that's actually fitted. It has to be carefully fitted, and it can protect the worker. Um, the other masks, even, just you and me wearing these masks, doc, what Dr. Fauci and what Dr. Shukat have said is that could actually sometimes be more harmful to you than not wearing a mask because if it's not fitted right, you're going to fumble with it, you're going to be touching your face, which is the number one way you're going to get disease is unclean hands touching your face. And so we're really, in every press conference I've been asked about masks, I've tried to settle these expectations that it's, it, that's not the be-all, end-all. Basic public health hygiene, washing hands at extended time for soap and water, not touching your face, coughing into your elbow. These are the best things for flu season, for common cold, for novel coronavirus that any of us can do for preparedness. I see. So you're not suggesting that the public access the N95 masks? No, no. We do not recommend that. We do wow. not recommend that. No. Okay. Cut. Let me ask you now about some of these cuts in, in your budget. Uh, first of all, HIV and AIDS. While you're look, while we know that we can achieve an AIDS-free generation by 2030, uh, you have a funding cut of 170 million uh, to PEPFAR, which of course reduces the transmission of HIV and AIDS throughout the world. Also, you have uh, a cut in Medicaid, which is the largest source of coverage for people with HIV. And so now it's estimated to cover 42 percent of people. And so while you're proposing an increase uh, or new money for Ryan White and CDC, you're cutting uh, 
42 percent, you're cutting Medicaid, which affects uh, 42 percent of the people. Secondly, and I'll do this very quickly, you propose to eliminate uh, the teen pregnancy program, and I want to follow up with Congresswoman Frankel's comment about this obsession with abortion that this administration has, yet you move forward and eliminate programs that prevent abortion, such as the teen pregnancy prevention program. You just zero that out. You zero out the uh, racial and ethnic approaches to community health, which is the only federal program that funds community-based organizations to address racial health disparities. And uh, you, for the most part, cut, uh, I think it's 30, 30 million uh, for the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And so th the impact of these cuts on minority communities, on young people, uh, on people living with HIV and AIDS, it, they're horrendous. And I wonder how you justify cutting uh, these programs, which really do uh, do good and, and help people uh, and provide for good quality public health strategies. So uh, we clearly agree with you on the importance of solving minority health disparities as well as supporting minority health. Um, we may just approach it in different programs and different ways of doing it. Um, we have, we're providing $5.7 billion for our health centers, which serve 1 in 12 Americans, and 62% of patients in our health centers are actually racial and ethnic minorities. Um, they're really one of the gems of our primary and preventive health system. Our HIV program that you mentioned, my my, the one that I really am very passionate about to end the HIV epidemic. The investment in Ryan White HIV AIDS there is critical, and that's going that, that's to, that serves 75% of Ryan White clients are actually racial and ethnic minorities. Yeah, but also you're cutting Medicaid, which serves 42% of people. Well, we're, as, as, as Congressman Harris mentioned, we're actually not even proposing a cut to Medicaid. We would slow the rate of growth from on Medicaid from 5. 1% per year to 3% per year, increasing in every single year of the budget outlook in terms of Medicaid. So it actually grows Medicaid just by not quite as much as its unsustainable current pathway for states. Yeah. Uh, okay, if we have a second go around, you can answer teen pregnancy prevention. That's totally crazy. Congresswoman Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Secretary, for being here. So when I was preparing for the hearing today, I really wanted to focus on the Low Income Housing Energy Assistance Program, LIHEAP. There has been a lot of unpredictability because we simply cannot understand the formula that is being used. And this impacts over 7 million families who rely on LIHEAP for their cooling and heating in the season. Um, so I was planning on asking you to follow up on the request of this committee that you provide a explanation of the formula. And uh, I was given this particular, um, this, this is the formula for LIHEAP uh, that I was given yesterday by some advocates. So I can understand why it is difficult uh, for you to understand, but I'm wondering if you can, I, I was planning on asking if you can tell us if you're going to have the formula explanation ready for us in time with the 120 day deadline that we gave you. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll work on getting that to you. I'm not familiar with the request that you had for the Allahi formula in terms of information, but we'll certainly work to get that to you. Okay, well, it was in our FY20 funding bill, and you have 67 days left to comply okay. with it. So <laughs> I would get cracking if I were you. Um, I'll, I'll put then, coronavirus on hold. <laughs> but then maybe it doesn't really matter because you put you completely eliminated lie heap in this budget. Is that right? Uh, as we have before, when with the budget environment, with budget caps, we had a 7.5%. But that's right. You decided, you decided to eliminate well, the we entire decided, program. We did, we did recommend that it's not as effective a program and it's duplicative of other state and local programs. Did you zero on. out the we, budget item? We have in each year. Congress, of course, you make the choices on whether to accept Okay, that. but that's your recommendation. It is our recommendation. And, yes. and basically you said that's because you think that utilities now cover this because many more states have that you cannot have your utilities cut off. Is that right? That's correct, as well as GAO findings about the risk of fraud and abuse in the program. It, it's a tight budget environment and making choices. It's a okay. large discretionary program. Okay, so, so you yeah. decided that seniors, families with children, um, 
that's going to be where we're going to make our decisions in a tight budget environment. I do want to note that many of the rural electric co-ops, municipal utilities, and many of the larger utility companies, the, the rural and municipal have none of these protections in most states. And in many states, it is not based on income, it's based on weather and trying to figure out a federal formula that nobody understands. But we'll look forward to your report. But then it got a little worse for LIHEAP because you not only eliminated it, you decided to transfer $37 million to uh, fighting the coronavirus. So that's another 750,000 families that you decided, okay, uh, they can go cold, uh, but we're going to put this money towards the coronavirus. And you also did that with $535 million in Ebola funding, which I know you talked about a little. Do you agree with those Ebola cuts? So as I mentioned earlier, on the emergency supplemental, we propose funding half of it through, tr through various transfers and reallocations. Congress can, of course, decide other funding sources or no funding sources for the money. Um, the Ebola money um, is, while it's useful to us right now, the most pressing need is the novel coronavirus. Um, and so I, I agree we can, with we can you. Restore that in coming years also as we think about That is a pressing need, but I certainly think that you understand as secretary that public health crises keep coming, and that's why you prepare. So I am mystified why the White House totally took apart the pandemic chain of command. And you've said today you don't think you need it. This is one of the smoothest operations. But breaking news while we'll sit here, and maybe the White House didn't inform you, is that there's a press conference at 6 o'clock, and the White House is, in fact, now saying we might need to appoint a czar to overlook this Pandemic. Not, no, not at all. The president and I spoke this morning as he returned from India, and he said, I want to keep being radically transparent. When you come over to brief me this evening, let's sit and invite the press in. That's quite that simple. <laughs> quite that simple. Okay, so you've, you've taken that apart. You've recommended uh, $700 million in cuts to CDC. You have underfunded our emergency response. $6.1 billion was what the president asked for in response to Ebola. This president is asking for $1.25 billion to address this pandemic. But how, if you consistently underfund the CDC, you've taken apart the chain of command, you are using other critical public health and security measures to fund this coronavirus, even at those very low levels, are we possibly able to be transparent, as you just said, and look at Americans and say, your country is doing everything we can, not only to prepare for this crisis, but for those that we know are coming in the future? I'm sorry, my, my time has expired. We are going to move to a, uh, Mr. Ray was not here, a second round and asking people to uh, do three minutes so everybody has a chance to say or do what they need to do, and then we will, um, we will, we will wrap up. I, I will just mention uh, that just says here, White House is weighing whether to appoint a cor coronavirus czar to coordinate response to the spreading epidemic. So I don't put much stock in anonymous sources in Politico. Well, anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I should hope you wouldn't. Well, we'll, well, we'll see what happens. But let me um, move to a, a, a different area. I'm told the DHS can still be given significant incident reports, which may include a child's past accounts of trauma or witnessed activity. You know, the vast majority of children that end up in ORR's care are there as a result of fleeing unimaginable violence, gang activity, poverty, desperate situations. What is ORR's policy with regard to sharing information sharing significant incidents reports collected by case managers or clinicians with ICE. It's my understanding that you have said, uh, Secretary uh, Azar, that you've talked about consent. How are children capable of giving consent to sharing notes from their confidential therapy sessions uh, with ICE? 
So uh, as we've discussed, the, the transmission of the clinical notes should not have happened. That was under the Obama guidance in 2016. That led to a misunderstanding where providers were putting their clinical notes either completely into the serious incident reports or they were being transmitted by OR incorrectly over to DHS. That should not have happened when we learned of it in August of 2019. That practice has stopped. We've corrected the understanding of providers. It is important. A serious incident report must be completed if a child evidences harm to self or harm to others, and that goes into the SIR, which does get transmitted to DHS as important information about the child, but that should be minimal information, not include, we believe in respecting that, that psychiatrist or mental health professional relationship. In terms of consent, our children who are not tender age, of course, um, they are in our care, um, and we they have to consent for medical treatment for any other things all the time. This is this is part of how OR has to operate. These are remember these are kids who don't have par who's left their parents, whose parents abandoned them, whose parents sent them here, um, and they consent. That is what they do for whether they're getting vaccines or whether they're getting What's medical their ability treatment. To, uh, and we try I mean, to keep in touch with parents as best we can, as you know. Well, but again, that requires probably. Uh, to have legal counsel uh, in, in order to be able to uh, uh, provide the, the child with recommendations, depending upon, obviously, the age. of Now, I don't know whether or not you require legal counsel uh, if, if a child is asked to consent to sending their clinic, clinical notes or significant incidents reports to DHS. Well, as you know, we do provide legal counsel. You fund it, so kids are offered uh, do have legal counsel. But we serve as the we serve as the guardian for these individuals. They do not. Need legal I, counsel I understand for every that, but the, but the guardianship has been uh, and, and there's some been some changes made. But guardianship hasn't been uh, uh, really uh, 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 that substantial. Uh, uh, that's as we have found out over the last two years about how we guard guard these children's. Uh, uh, private rights, etc. It hasn't been the case. I would hope we would get to direct representation, legal representation of children. Uh, what guidance have you given case managers, clinicians to distinguish in the child's file or in their report that a child has witnessed gang activity or violence without forever associating that child as a gang member? There is a important distinction if that's what justifies sharing the child's information with law enforcement. Uh, we'd be happy to work with you. The guidance that went out in August of 2019, I don't know about the divide between witnessing versus participation, okay. and we'd be happy, happy to share that with you. We'd like to yeah. see that guidance, and would like to sit down and figure out what your oversight is of DHS uh, with regard to this, uh, the transmittal of this, uh, this information. Congressman Harris. Thank you very much, and thanks again, uh, Mr. Secretary, for... Uh, uh, staying over two hours to talk with us about the important subjects. Um, you know, with regards to the uh, budget request, the emergency request, look, I applaud the department for doing what, what every department should do. When they come to Congress for an emergency request, which of course exceeds our budget caps, so this, this just directly contributes without the constraints of a budget cap to our uh, debt and deficit, uh, of actually only asking for one, for only half of it coming from really new funding and the rest finding places where we perhaps over budgeted or we, we gained efficiencies and transferred it. So for instance, you know, the uh, 535 million from Ebola. Well, the fact of the matter is you, you mentioned, we do have a vaccine. We actually are participating with the international community in controlling Ebola. And uh, it seems perfectly reasonable, instead of asking for new money above budget caps, uh, I just read something that, that I think over in the Senate side, someone's requesting $8 billion or something. I mean, you couldn't spend the money fast enough. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Is there anything that, that could have been done up till now that hasn't been done that you haven't had money for? No. No. Nope. We've had that money. We've used oh. the, thanks to this committee, the Infectious Disease Rapid Response Fund. We've been spending that. And then with our transfer authority, we'll continue to spend as a bridge to whenever we get the emergency supplemental. And we're using that money to seed contracts to be able to execute more ex on the expansions once we receive the sub. Sure. And in fact, we have novel vaccine having been developed. We have a novel antiviral having been developed. You know, we used to say, it used to be in the Maryland legislature, and we only met three months of out of every year. We'd say, well, we meet every year, so if a problem isn't that acute, you can bring it back. But Congress meets all year, don't we? I'm going to ask you, do you take an August recess and an October recess? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. So we could, I mean, God forbid, this becomes more serious than, than and it's anticipated it could be serious, more serious. 
We could actually come back any time and pass emer more emergency funding above our budget caps, couldn't we? we? We could, and in addition, it's important to remember, this request is only for 2020 funding. So through September of this year, and then we've said we would work with appropriators on modifying 2021 requests based on the progress of the disease over the next weeks and months. Right, and then the plan transfers uh, that, that have occurred is, is uh, I read this chart, right, is, is 135 million out of 81 billion. So that's I believe 0.2%. I think it's a little less than 0.2%, actually. You're, you're being a little generous about that. I think it's actually less than that. And finally, just to, just to clear up one, uh, one question, because the question came about LIHEAP, but do I recall in the Obama budgets that LIHEAP was zeroed out? I do not remember if that's the case or not. I what, it was cut? Oh, so it was cut, it was cut in previous administration budgets. So you're just doing what previous, you're just following the lead of previous administrations. Well, on, th on that I applaud you for following the lead. On other things I don't. Finally, look, on Title X funding, the fact of the matter is that, that, you, know, that you and I both understand exactly what Title X was intended for. It was never meant uh, to promote or fund abortions. Uh, there are a vast number of Americans uh, who, who believe that taxpayer dollars should not be used to promote or fund abortions. And I congratulate the administration on finally uh, restoring Title X to its initial purpose and, uh, and again, allowing us to go home to, our, to uh, many of my constituents who, uh, who f strongly believe, who oppose abortion, and who believe the federal government has no role in, in uh, promoting or funding abortion. So I thank you and I yield back. Mr. Polk here. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. Um, okay, so I just want to make sure I understand on this is our part. Okay, we just got an alert coming out. You said, I don't put much stock in anonymous sources in Politico, but that is neither a yes or no. So you had a conversation this morning with the president. Have you ever discussed uh, having a czar? Well, first, I'm not going to discuss my dis the content okay, of my interactions and advice to the president, but the but the but the president is the one who said consistent with the national response framework as well as emergency yeah. as emergency support function eight, which actually played a role in designing that HHS is the lead agency on a public health. You emergency. don't anticipate a czar. Uh, I don't anticipate one. This is working extremely well. If it doesn't work or if there's a need for a change as there's, for instance, implication of other emergency support functions under the NRP, gotcha. then that would be for the okay. president to decide perhaps there's a multi multi-ESF leadership, which is part of the NRP, is contained okay, in there so also. So you're saying from your conversations you don't expect a czar to be appointed today? I, I do not. Any time in the near future. All right. That's good. Jared Kushner will have more free time then because I'm sure otherwise he takes on a lot of those responsibilities. So that's good to know. Um, let me go back to the question that Ms. Granger asked because I just over vacation uh, read um, China RX uh, and pretty scary. You know, when you look at the amount of stuff that's being done, this is your wheelhouse, right, where you came from. Um, I am really concerned, and I saw the president had a directive for military personnel, especially about buying American. Um, are you concerned that so many of our drugs or essential ingredients in drugs are made in places like China? I think they said 90 percent of generics probably or 80 percent of production, but 90 percent of the essential ingredients are made in China, that at some point that could cause some uh, problems, especially given some of the last, some of the, the recent various commerce activities we've had with China, how they could hold things up, or in this case, what could happen in the Wuhan province where people may have to stop working for a while and you could have some problems. Are we able to do anything? Are we able to try to get production back in the United States? So um, I am concerned about that, uh, having our supply chain, especially on medical products, which can be strategic, so intertwined with China or any other, dependent on any other country, is a challenge. Here's the issue, and I know you have, as do I, a deep passion around getting drug prices down. If there's a reason they're being made in China or India, and that's low-cost manufacturing, so yeah, if let me, we if force I can, them to make them here, we could see an increase. To that in very price. point, though, how much does it actually cost to produce a pill? So, like, uh, the hep C pill is $1,000 a pill, right? What is the actual production cost on average for a pill? Well, it depends on the product, but the difference is, especially on generic manufacturing. But what is the, the average cost countries? of production I, for a pill? I couldn't tell you that. It depends on the product. Ten cents, a dollar, a hundred dollars? It would depend on the product. and yeah. But... but Manufacturing generics, just we see this, is materially different in yeah. lower cost countries than in the U.S. That's why we don't see. So, how about on production. generic drugs? Because we know they're generic, the cost difference. I'm just trying to decide why a company, like, are they saving a nickel? Or are they saving 50 well, cents by doing that and risking our, our flow potentially of those? I think it's drugs. important to remember the generic business is an extremely low margin, high volume business. And so, even the, what you and I may think of as a penny difference, 
could be bankruptcy versus success for a generic company on that difference in manufacturing with competitors. So I, I, I absolutely understand it is a critical issue. I don't know the solution. I want to work with you on that because I don't want to do something that causes our generic prices to, to soar, of course. Thank you. Thank you. I want to shift gears a little bit um, to the announcement uh, for the Healthy Adult Opportunity uh, 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 proposal. And I noted that CMS specifically stated that children in very low income households will, quote, not, will be, will not be, quote, directly affected. Um, you know, one of the things that I have found that goes unnoticed is that um, kids are about 20% of the Medicaid population. I should say it this way, they're about 40% of the population, they're about 20 or less percent of the actual dollars spent. So any kind of shifts within Medicaid, I believe, need to be done with a specific eye towards safeguarding, really, the intended recipients of the program. It's a safety net program, mostly for uh, a certain population. I think children are kind of front and center in that. I wanted to know how the... the um, Department is going to keep so so and and I I know the the answer I've heard before is the states are going to do the states can do that I don't trust that my state is going to do that to the best I should say it this way I I am a trust but verify with regard to how my state is going to make sure that the adults aren't just protected and we're going to push the kids to the edge because I have children with disabilities who are on uh, Medicaid who come to me and say they get put at the back of the wait lists with regard to Medicaid. So how is the department going to be able to step in? I know this is a little different from some of the Republican states' rights questions, you know, give it all to the states. Well, what if, what if we haven't necessarily seen the best um, instances of children being protected at the state level? How is your department going to be able to do that in the midst of this new proposal? Well, I would, I would just note first that the actual proposal or the actual opportunity is literally called the Healthy Adult Opportunity. It is an optional demonstration program for states to restructure benefits for adult populations. Um, it's important to remember this is not a mandatory change. This would only be if a state wanted to do it. It would require CMS approval. There's no entitlement on approval. It just states a pathway for that we're open to look at these. It doesn't allow stripping of benefits, limits on eligibility. They can't cap or limit adult enrollment even. So that's even with regard to adults. It requires coverage of essential health benefits. So even with regard to adults whose name is in the title, all of those protections are in place. And so that's why it, for, for low-income individuals, for pregnant women, early, the elderly adults, people disabled, the traditional Medicaid populations aren't in any way impacted by that. This is that the, the able-bodied adult expansion populations under okay. the Affordable Care Act that would be at issue. Perfect. That's what I wanted to know. And I'm glad you mentioned the pregnant women receiving Medicaid. That's the other piece there. In my view, the, the goal should be to keep Medicaid as a safety net, a strong, robust safety net for those who it was intended to serve. And for those who are not, who shouldn't be part of, who weren't part of the original outlay, I think we need to get them into different programs and different options to get them care so that we're not breaking the safety net for, um, you know, a single mom with three children, one of whom has multiple, um, you know, uh, uh, different abilities. So I appreciate that. Um, continuing with the discussion on child health uh, and disease, particularly with regard to research, um, they generally receive significantly less attention and funding compared to other age groups. In 2021, in, in the 2021 proposal, um, what's the administration doing to focus on child health and research and on childhood diseases? Uh, so, as you know, the President's Pediatric Care Initiative, which you all uh, funded uh, through NIH, is really important because children and cancer really have been neglected for too long. Um, uh, different disease profiles, so we've been building up the databases to share information so that we can actually help discover cures targeted for kids. Um, so that's been part of the work of NIH, but really the budget continues that funding with $50 million in 2021 on top of what you already funded. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Congresswoman Hill. I'm sorry, Frankel. Congresswoman Frankel. Okay. Okay. My turn? Your turn. Okay, my turn. Thank, thank, thank you. All right. I'm going to get back to our last subject. So I just I want to correct what I think was uh, some misinformation that you put out or maybe a spin 
I'll tell you about Planned Parenthood, its last report, 2.4 million patients, 9.7 million services provided, over 4.7 million ST, STI testing and treatment, 2.6 million birth control information services. They estimated that they, uh, approximately 400,000 unintended pregnancies were averted. Over 500,000 breast exams and pap smears and 1.2 million people reached through education and outlet. So I would say, and I think most people in the public would say, that Planned Parenthood has done a really good service, especially to poor women and women of color in this country. And your administration has basically with what we call, with a very, very cruel gag rule, so putting the gag rule uh, on steroids. And what does that mean, They gagging? It's like they put a piece of cloth across the doctor's mouth because I think we need to all understand that federal money is never used for abortions. And Planned Parenthood has never used federal money for abortions. Oh, you're gonna get the little red sticker from somebody there. But the, the fact of the matter is, um, now, with the new gag rule on steroids, a provider who does not use federal money for abortions cannot even tell somebody, can't eat, when they go into office, if, if a patient says, what are my options? They are now gagged, the provider is gagged. And, and what Planned Parent has done uh, which I think is very courageous, but unfortunately, I think it's going to maybe hurt a lot of women, uh, is, is they've said, we are not going to be untruthful with our patients. We are an, org we are a, a, an organization that if a patient comes in for care, we're going to tell them the truth. And I just, I wanted to give you another example uh, of your al the, al the alternatives that are being provided in this country and now that Planned Parenthood has, has had to withdraw. In Louisiana, the, the state list of alternative providers include dentists and nursing homes. And in Florida, it includes uh, school nurses. In Ohio, it includes food banks. So I would just, uh, I, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I, I'm gonna end up by saying this. The women and the girls in this country, we need to be in charge of our own bodies in order to have full, productive lives, not Donald Trump be in charge of our bodies. And with that, I yield back. Congressman Cole. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, just a couple of quick questions. Um, I know uh, you're working hard on the President's uh, request for targeted HIV testing. and. Uh, working toward the uh, hopefully elimination in the next uh, 10 years, this dreaded disease. But uh, unfortunately, the Interior Subcommittee did not provide additional resources to the Indian Health Service as part of this initiative. Uh, you and I have had a little discussion about this. You know, what can be done as we move forward? And again, I let me just make clear, that's no criticism for our colleagues on the Interior Health, because they have a very low budget. Actually, the chairman and I were talking about it. Very difficult for them to provide the resources that they would like to do, given the range of responsibilities they have. So I, I sympathize with them, but this is an important initiative. We've got to find a way to get it funded in Indian country. It, it's, it's quite important. Um, we used money Congress had given us uh, in 2019 to do four jumpstart projects. So we funded planning in all of the 57 jurisdictions so that as soon as you funded the president's request, we would be able to get off to the races as we did with the funding from HRSA this morning, the 117 million that I announced um, on, on executing. We had four jurisdictions, one of which was the Cherokee Nation that we advance funded so they could actually get moving right away on it in anticipation of funding for tribal territory. Um, we do have in this budget request a request of $27 million uh, for IHS that would support the critical needs of the disproportionately affected on the HIV spread in Indian country. That would be expanding HIV testing in Indian country, connecting American Indians and Alaska Natives to care, getting previously undiagnosed HIV infections in treatment so that they can be, um, un if, they're, if they're undetectable, they can be untransmissible getting PrEP out among people who are at risk to ensure that they cannot transmit to others, 
and also supporting disease surveillance in tribal epidemiology centers. Well, again, we appreciate your efforts. I have very little time left. This is a big question, but uh, all of us know uh, suicide rates have been rising literally in every state in the country. So I'm uh, interested in what you have in your budget that uh, might help us to do more in that particular area. So we've been very active, especially in supporting on suicide with regard to our veterans. So we, with the, the suicide hotline now, has a very important function. The very first question you're asked if you call the suicide hotline is, are you a veteran? If you're a veteran, we've, we now have an immediate hot transfer over to a live person who will give immediate counseling tailored to veterans and their risk of suicide. We've collaborated very closely between NIH and DOD and VA and have come up with, out with um, um, artificial intelligence algorithms that help us actually predict based on a veteran's history w certain categories, certain individuals who are at much higher risk of suicidality. Those individuals actually receive, I think it's monthly coaching and, inter and proactive intervention. So we really hope that this collaboration between us and DOD and VA can help with the, the just devastating issue of our veteran, veteran suicide issues. Um, we're also investing, of course, suicide prevention programs, 93 million community mental health, service, mental health services block grants with an increase of 35 million there, so and many other programs that are in the budget. It's, the suicidality is a very important priority for us. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, I, I need you to check back with your department because my understanding is that New Jersey was specifically told to get ready to be able to uh, house or, or deal with those individuals that would come through the funnel airport. And that's why they were looking to uh, use the joint Air Force Base. And that's why it's important because the, the ability to use that is being eliminated as of next week. Um, two other things really quickly. I'm really pleased that you find uh, maternal morbidity a really important issue. Um, and I know we recognize that nearly half of pregnancies are unplanned. Women need to be able to have the kind of health care that they need when they find out that they're pregnant. I've been working on a Healthy Moms Act, which would open up a special enrollment period for women who are find themselves pregnant. But I know you can do that by executive order, by just, you know, by your authority, and I'd like to work with you on that. Would you be willing to... Happy work to, with uh, me. Yeah, I, I, I haven't been familiar with that as a special okay. enrollment period option, but I'm happy to look at that and work oh, with great. you on that. Okay. I, did, I did not know that that wasn't uh, that for new. So for new pregnant women, there's not currently an, a special enrollment right. period. No, it's oh. not. Con uh, I didn't it's know not that. eligible right now. Okay, okay, we can talk about that. Last thing is, I did a lot of work with the special task force on mental health issues and uh, black youth suicide. As a result of that, we did a uh, we, we had a a report done by a series of um, professionals, working groups, identified a lot of the issues that your department uh, can address. So I'm concerned about the $200 million cut to the NIMH. Um, I would like to, with unanimous consent, enter this report, which is called Ring the Bell, the Crisis of Black Youth Suicide in America, into the record. And I'd very much like to have the opportunity to work with you on making sure that some of these very important issues, particularly as access to culturally competent services, enough services, um, and, and research on and things of that nature are addressed. Absolutely. That could be very valuable for us in our work on suicide. So, no, I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Without, uh, yeah, we will uh, unanimous consent to enter the document. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Lee. Very much. Okay, I want to go back to a couple of my um, remarks and questions earlier, Mr. Secretary. First of all, you know that uh, PEPFAR has been a bipartisan uh, initiative since we uh, really began this when President Bush was president. And, and so every year uh, we're trying to make sure that we're on target in terms of reaching the 2030 goals of uh, really eliminating HIV and AIDS. So this budget, though, calls for a $170 million cut in PEPFAR, which does not make any sense if, in fact, we're going to keep working together to try to get to, to our goals. So I'm not sure what the rationale was for putting forth a, a cut. That's a significant cut to the PEPFAR program. We need to increase it. Secondly, again, with regard to teen pregnancy prevention, for the life of me, I can't understand why you would eliminate this when we know for a fact 
that a wide, a wide range of evidence-based and innovative interventions to support the sexual health of young people uh, is extremely important. It helps develop a healthy, uh, it really develops a, the education that's needed to help our young people prevent abortions. And so I can't understand why um, you would eliminate that program. Also, uh, it harms young people who are already marginalized, like uh, LGBTQ youth and young people who have been victims of sexual violence. And so eliminating this program, what's the rationale and what's the um, uh, basis for that. And then finally, you mentioned community health centers, which are wonderful and provide health services where the, there are many gaps in both rural and urban communities, but they don't address the basic racial health disparities. And you know what they are. And so the REACH program uh, provides uh, strategies to address the basic uh, racial disparities in chronic health and the National Institute of Minority Health, it impacts billions of Americans by uh, providing in the health delivery system specific uh, perspectives and, and strategies to reduce um, race um, health disparities as it relates to minority communities. So why would you cut that also? I mean, minority communities are really under attack uh, through this budget. With regard to PEPFAR, I would have to defer to the Department of State on that. That's their program. I, I'm not consulted on the funding levels for PEPFAR in terms of, but I would say PEPFAR is obviously an important program. I've gotten to see the fruits of the work of PEPFAR in building up public health capacity. PEPFAR plus the global health security agenda, as I've traveled the DRC, Rwanda, Uganda on the Ebola crisis, I've gotten to see the fruits of that, that important work there. Um, the teen pregnancy prevention program, um, we just, we fundamentally disagree in terms of whether those are evidence-based interventions that actually from an evidence perspective deliver. The rate of teen pregnancy was declining long before the TPP was put in place. It serves less than 1% of the teen population and a longitudinal study of the program actually during the Obama administration looked at 37 of those programs and it found that 73% of them either had no impact or actually a detrimental impact in terms of STDs and, and teen pregnancy, well, I beg teen you initiation of with sex. You, uh, Mr. Secretary, years of research have shown that ap the abstinence only approach not only fails uh, in getting young people to delay sex, but also can harm young people. Congresswoman Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I first want to correct myself. I told you that there were 67 days to get the congressionally mandated report. It's actually 53. So um, an even bigger challenge than I first reported. Um, and I just want to add that um, President Obama never proposed eliminating LIHEAP, but he did propose dramatic cuts to it, to the tune of $3 billion. And it was strong, bipartisan, opposition that rescued this program. I certainly hope we will see that again this year from your proposal to completely eliminate it. But switching gears, Madam Chair, I would ask unanimous consent to enter this letter from the American Psychological Association chief into the record. And this letter is addressed to you as of February 21st and is concerning the very dangerous and disturbing practice that we are seeing emerging at ORR, where, as you know, uh, we are required, you are obligated to act in the best interest of immigrant children in their care, but reports are that the notes from the psychotherapy sessions of children who have experienced trauma are being shared by ORR with ICE, and this information is being used against the children in deportation proceedings, even though these conversations are supposed to be confidential. What are you doing to halt the sharing of this confidential information with ICE? So I'm, I'm glad you raised that because I've been able to have a discussion with the chairwoman um, in private before the hearing about this issue. We agree that those notes and that interaction between the mental health provider and the child should be normally confidential. There are exceptions, as the APA would make clear also, where there's a risk of harm to the child or to others. But that's not where there was guidance put out in 2016 in the Obama administration that, that was not clear, and it led to two mistakes happening. One was clinician notes were provided, and that was not correct to DHS. And sometimes clinicians just cut and pasted their notes into the serious incident report in the management system 
where they should have just noted there was a threat of harm to self or other, which they have to do by law, um, and they cut and pasted in, and that was provided. When we learned about this in August of 2019, before any media reports, um, we stopped it. We issued corrective guidance and said that's not proper. Minimal information should go in the serious incident report and go over, um, but it should not have happened. Okay. We agree with you. Speaking of children in custody, as I think about places that you can get money to address this coronavirus, and I still don't know why we're building a public health response uh, once the pandemic threat is already here, but has the contract for Homestead where we were paying $720,000 a day to not house children, uh, has that actually ended as of November 30th? I don't know. I don't think it has ended as of number 30th um, or what the current contours are. I can explain to you why we have that contract, which is in response, in fact, to the chairwoman and this committee's concerns around the care for kids. We have, we're increasing fixed capacity, but we do need influx capacity in the event that if Mexico changes border policy and we see kids, the number one priority is not letting them be backed up at ICE or at the border and coming so down. That, so that $80 million we've spent not to house children, you feel that is better spent than putting that money into coronavirus. That's, that's really an incredible set of priorities. Thank you. Let me just recognize the ranking member for some closing remarks, and then I have uh, two or three efforts, and I'm mindful of your hard time. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I'll, I'll be brief. First, I want to thank you for the hearing. Uh, excellent hearing, a lot of good questions, a lot of uh, excellent points made, I think, uh, by every member on the committee. And I want to commit to you again. I look forward to working with you uh, on the supplemental. I thought uh, the points you made were good points. We want additional detail, but we intend to work together on this and, uh, and certainly work with you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, and let me uh, finish by thanking you again and your team. Look, I, I, this committee has worked hard for five years on a bipartisan basis to create the institutions that I think are serving us very well now. Uh, obviously, uh, your entire department, but specifically the NIH, the CDC, the strategic stockpile, uh, the uh, creation of the rapid response, infectious disease rapid response fund. All those things, I think, have put us in a position to do well. Uh, and I think you've done a good job. I think you guys have been very transparent with us from day one. I think the congressional briefs have been excellent. Appearance, a uh, number of members of your department uh, before the, the, uh, this committee and a special briefing session that my good friend, the chairman, convened for us, extremely helpful. So, um, I, you know, I, the contrast between what I saw yesterday in the Senate uh, and what I saw here today on both sides of the aisle makes me very proud of, of our chamber and this subcommittee. Uh, I think... Uh, we have a lot of people saying a lot of things that either haven't been participating in the process or have not been transparent about it. And again, I want to also thank you because you did commit here, and I know it's sincere commitment, that uh, if we need to go beyond uh, your initial recommendation to protect the American people, we're all prepared to do that. Uh, so I, I don't look at that. I, I want to be prudent in the use of funds. I know my colleagues up here uh, do as well, but uh, we're like you. And I remember in one of our briefings, I think it was actually one that the chairman and I uh, coordinated, you made the statement uh, that, uh, you know, you would rather do too, be accused of doing too much in retrospect than accused of, of doing too little. And uh, I think you've been true to that commitment every step of the way. I think the people that work with you have as well, and I, I'm very confident you'll continue to do that. So thanks for your hard work on behalf of the American people. Thanks, too, for your honesty and transparency here. Uh, we'll try to help you in a lot of the places you need help, and then we're going to help you in some places you probably uh, officially don't need help, but we officially think you do. Uh, and uh, so I, I look forward to that working relationship, and again, just thank you for uh, your service to the American people. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. If I could, I'll just wrap up being mindful of, of your, t your time frame. I would just tell you that uh, the issue of uh, suicide uh, makes me, uh, and, the, and the commentary on that makes me view that you need to review whether or not you want to cut $25 million from gun violence prevention research where the basic focus is on suicides. It's mostly suicides with veterans, and I don't care how good the hotline is, we need to find out what is going on in the minds of veterans and others uh, in, in order uh, to be able to why they are taking 
uh, their lives. But the issue of, of uh, we're not going to talk influx facilities today. My colleague mentioned this, but we are. Uh, very flat out, and I will just tell you, it is my goal with an empty facility and millions of dollars being spent and the numbers declining as they are, and we're nowhere near capacity at the state licensed shelters, we're going to shut them down uh, because we can uh, deal with the issues in other ways. Uh, I might also add the issue came up with regard to cuts. Um, determining whether a federal budget proposal counts as a budget cut is simple. If the proposal would reduce funding for a program's benefit or services, or reduce the number of people who qualify for benefits relative to levels that would occur under current law, it's a cut. We're cutting $920 billion over 10 years to Medicaid, $756 billion over 10 years for Medicare. Um, I, I want to get in, uh, uh, let, let me just do this, because you, you mentioned this, uh, Mr. Secretary, and I thought it was very clear. You stated that infectious disease, global health and preparedness were prioritized in the CDC budget request. Following essential programs, we uh, were proposed for cuts, which makes the commentary, quite frankly, inconsistent. Um, cutting CDC, $693 million, or 9%. Uh, we're cutting Infectious Disease Rapid Response Fund by $35 million, 41%, and you don't not replenishing it in uh, your, your supplemental. The Public Health Data Initiative, $20 million, a 40% cut, specifically asked by the Director Redfield in order for us to modernize our efforts to transform public health data into analysis so that we can move more quickly. The Public Health Workforce, which we talked about today, $6 million, or 12%. Uh, and the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Program, by $40 million, there's a cut, 18%. Uh, this flies in the face of what you have talked about in terms of what your goals are. Lastly, about information sharing with DHS. Is ORR sharing information about rejected sponsor applicants with ICE uh, at, at DHS? So we have shared the names and addresses of 141 individuals who were denied sponsorship due to criminal histories or due to fraudulent representations to OR that they have a bona fide relationship with a child. No parents were included in that group. Um, and then whenever we you have, are, I'm sorry? You are prohibited by law from detaining sponsors based on information that HHS collects on potential sponsors during the vetting process. Well, again, I don't, I don't detain sponsors, but also the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security is complying with the legal restraints in the act. But this is not parents, this is, this is, individuals denied sponsorship due to criminal histories or due to fraudulent representations to ORR that they would that they have a bona fide relationship with the child no parents being included in that group is what I'm informed can you tell me also is ORR sharing information with DHS on any adult who does not fall into the categories included in the DHS rider the prohibition on use of funds to detain a sponsor unless they have a certain specific criminal criteria. Uh, I'd, I'd want to get back to you okay. on the details there. We certainly are complying with the rider, um, but if there's anything beyond the rider, I don't have that detail. And I would like the information. Yep. What kind of firewall exists between ORR's information about potential sponsors and ICE, given that information sharing for enforcement actions is prohibitive? Use of it for enforcement may be prohibited, but there's no firewall that's required, and so information is shared, and it's been shared, frankly, for, I think, for quite some time. For instance, we share information on sponsors within 24 hours of discharge, and that's part of also double, for, there are a couple things. One, the sponsor actually has to certify to us and to DHS that if they move the child, that that will be reported. Remember, this is a child who is not legally in the country and subject to proceedings. And second, that they that the sponsor isn't, for instance, illegally in the country and subject to a deport removal order and about to be deported. That wouldn't be a safe environment for us to then place the child. So there's that last minute check and information sharing. I think that has gone on. Well, we need to get a very a very decade, detailed view of the current information that is being shared and whether or not is in contravention of the rider in the bill. And uh, further to that is that we need because. ICE walks into state licensed facilities and fingerprints, and you may or may not know about it. 
ICE is transmitting, ORR is transmitting clinical notes. There are all kinds of, of avenues here which are being breached in terms of the privacy and the, and, the, and the care of these children and the intimidation of these children. We need to get to a point where that's no longer the case and that ORR and DHS have only their concern about the welfare of these children. And yes, I understand criminal activity, I understand human trafficking, but we have seen over the last year and a half or more that we are moving into what is really unbelievable mental health issues arising out of intimidation of children that are in our care. And I, they're in your care, but they are in our care while they're here, and we're not going to continue to, to put up with that. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being up front with us uh, on issues. And as my colleague said, um, we want to uh, be ahead of this crisis uh, on the coronavirus. We do not want to be behind the curve. So thank you. Thank you.